Good morning, everybody. As I told you yesterday, the way I'm going to try to run this is that we're going to start and have you or us discuss things together before I just push ahead and go through another entire lecture. We'll see how well that works. If it doesn't work, I'll just keep lecturing. And, uh, but my ideal scenario is that we spend so much time discussing that we don't make it through all the slides. And then I will just push those slides to tomorrow's lectures or whatever. I have also updated the schedule so that now your schedule should be complete in the sense that I've, also, I've marked all events when we plan to have computer labs. There are actually a total of 11 of them marked. I don't expect that we will have more than 10. But I figured it's so much better for you to know roughly when we plan this and what pace we plan them. And then some of those events might disappear. That's probably better than the opposite, suddenly getting new events. The facility manager for the Cryean facility is not here this week. So my plan is that directly after Easter, either Monday, April 4 or Tuesday, April 5, we're also going to go down and do a study visit and have a look, not just at the microscopes, that we can do anytime, but also have a bit of a look at their images, what type of data we can get from these things. And then Dari and Bjorn might tell you a little bit about the data processing they're doing for it too. The final thing when it comes to schedules is that uh, we talked a little bit about yesterday that about research seminars and interests, right? And one thing I realized, we actually have a structured journal club going on every Thursday morning, 9 a.m. in this building. Tomorrow we're going to have Laura Oriana from my team uh, talking about epidermal growth factor receptors and models. And this is related to cancer models in mice, actually. It's pretty fun stuff. She's gone all the way from theory and model building. And then she's been able to find likely transition states where these things bind. Is that something you're interested in? So maybe I will, uh, at least when these lectures fit, I might actually plan for us at 9 a.m. on Thursdays, we start by going to this journal club. Uh, or it's journal club. It's a group meeting, seminar, whatever. And then we start the actual lecture at 10 instead. Um, as always, the quality of these things, I think the quality of the research is always good. The quality of a lecture, or rather how interesting it is, it depends a lot on what you're doing. Some of these can be extremely theoretical. You might have a student talking about theory development on refinement methods. Uh, next week you have somebody talking about super applied stuff. Um, but that's the nature of research. People do different things. Good. I will plan that in the schedule and I've also entered some other things. Uh, Again, the idea with these seminars, they should be voluntary. You should go there if you find them interesting. I might add even more things, but don't feel that... Basically, I'm not going to ask any questions about the research seminars on the exam. The exam are going to be on the topic of the course. So what we talked about yesterday, as you probably remember, um, that's the advantage of doing things at full pace. You don't have a chance to forget. I talked a little bit about experimental, not just structure determination, but methods in general. And I, in particular, I brought up these two methods, X-ray crystallography, which has been the, this has been the basis of almost everything we know in structural biology. But this is gradually giving ground, in particular, to cryo-electron microscopy. There are some other methods. Uh, I'm not, I don't even remember whether the book mentions them. In particular, one called nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. I'm not going to say that NMR is dying, that would be wrong, but I think it's fair to say that NMR has always had a bit of a special life. Oh, we have a visit here, come in. Um, and uh, NMR has an advantage of being able to show you how molecules work in solution, but it's not really a method that's resolution-wise is competitive with either of these two. We have a visitor today. As I mentioned to some of you, those six of you who are in the SciLife Lab Master Program, which is not everybody in the course, you're going to have a chance to do internships or what? If, yes, we call them internships, right? Or summer projects in this building. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or rather, everybody is, of course, welcome to do these internships. But when it comes to the SciLife Lab students, we managed to get this building to pay you a little bit for it. So as I told some of you, maybe not the newest one, Emma is going to spend a couple of minutes at least going through this. OK, we'll do that later. I can compile it. Thank you so much, Emma. So, sorry for that brief interruption. Um, I am actually, there are a bunch of other things, but since we covered this yesterday, I will jump straight ahead to a more fun tutorial. These are roughly the study questions I gave you yesterday. And I actually, I think I removed one because I realized that's stuff that we don't really cover until chapter three or four, the hydrogen bonds in water, sorry about that. But then I added, I think one or two more, so we got all the way to 20. If I just start asking you things, absolutely nothing is going to happen here. So I have a suggestion. 
you start picking questions and you can so pick a question you would like to answer and answer it and the idea is that if you're quiet and wait you can end up with the really hard questions at the end yes go right ahead Yes. Yeah. Yes, and why? No side chain. No exactly. The point is as to chirality requires four different groups around something. Two hydrogens, that criterion fails. Check. And then I was really close to start making marks on the screen, which I want. If you're really smart, you might actually have a in theory there are some questions that might have two answers, but I, I think that's <laughs> extra information. Four, 19 to go. Is function induced structure? No. no. And why not? This is actually a hard question uh, that I did not bring up. So it's related to something that I'm not sure. Do we have a separate? Well, it's related to number seven, of course. Is it because multiple structures could do the same function and similar structures? Yes, and it's related to what we call the central dogma of molecular biology, which is what? Sequence, Sequence leads to structure, leads to function, but it's a directed graph. Arrows only go one way. Now, the complication that I did not bring up yesterday, oops, the complication that I did not bring up yesterday is that there, are, there is a phenomenon called convergent evolution. And convergent evolution really means that two, spe two species, or at least two different genes, they might not be evolutionary related, but they might somehow evolve towards the same functionality. And this is complicated because as we brought up in this course, in many cases, there is really one obvious fold or geometry to achieve a certain functionality, right? And nature has had 4.3 billion years of trial and error. And if you have 4 billion years of trial and error, and this is a very simple functionality, eventually it's likely that both these genes will find the same optimal structure. So I would argue that that is the exception that confirms the rule. Occasionally you can actually have that the function somehow leads to a structure, but it's still, I would still then say that it's, it does not induce structure. It's not that a specific function means that it has to have a specific function with, with a few, spe with a few uh, special exceptions. Um, so in general, the answer is no. You could imagine that if you want a large molecule that should bind a heme group, a protoporphyrin, then it turns out that it's really nice to have histidines above and below it, but that's local structure. So locally we might do it, but glob uh, globally it never happens. Much longer answer than I brought up yesterday. Does that answer seven? I think that largely answers seven too, yes. Some brownie points there. <laughs> uh, number five? Mm -hmm. What would happen if we had some Yes, and in, and in particular it would be incompatible. There are other things. In theory it would of course be able to interact, right? But it would interact in a different way. And when you say other proteins, other amino acids, are the things you're thinking about there? Um, I guess like we were talking about yesterday with like drug design, like it wouldn't, you know, maybe the proteases in your stomach wouldn't be able to properly break them down. Oh. And exactly, that's, that's important because sadly, whenever, whether we're doing bioinformatics or biophysics, we always visualize proteins one on one. And that's really bad in a way because proteins, any protein will interact with at least 100 or 1,000 partners. It's, it's a soup inside a cell. Um, any protein, you need to build it somehow in the, uh, in the ribosome. You need to degrade it at some point. So the, the whole point, they're not really, they're not compatible with all the L isomers that formed every single one of these 100 interaction partners. But as you say, occasionally that can, occasionally it's a really good thing not to be compatible with stuff. So that begs another question. What if you had a protein that consisted entirely of D isomers? Yes, so the helix would be left handed instead. And, th and this, is, this is important, right? Because normally in, f in physics, you frequently talk about symmetry. Um, and you can even talk about symmetry from particle physics point of view and everything. But in general, physics is symmetric. It doesn't matter whether you, you have the same laws of physics, whether you're doing something on the left hand or the right hand side, right? But the problem is that this chirality leads to what you call a symmetry break. 
And that's why, for instance, an alpha helix is always right-handed, right? Because in principle, that's a break of symmetry. The mirror image obeys the same physical laws, but we can't form... Well, you, you can actually form a left-handed helix, but that's not really... That's not going to be a mirror. Even with normal L-amino acids, you can form a helix going in the other direction, but it's going to be a very unfavorable helix that occupies a small part in the Ramachandran map. So the reason why alpha helices are right-handed is because we have the isomers we do. So why, why do we have L isomers, not D isomers? I don't know. Yeah. Nobody knows. Um, so at, at some point, maybe, maybe nature started to evolve that way by chance, yes. And, and of course, when nature starts to evolve that way, we have to stay that way or, or we're not going to be compatible. But that's an unanswered question. No, Organism. because I remember, the laws of physics are symmetric, right? Yeah. If, if we took you, your entire body, and turned every single amino acid into a D instead of an L amino acid, it would still work. Yeah. Everything, would be, everything would be internally consistent and compatible. So the laws of physics are the same, but these kind of, they're two worlds that exist on one, one side each of a mountain ridge, right? It's very hard to cross this ridge because they're not compatible with each other. But the laws of physics are the same. The Almost, yes. But they're not going to annihilate each other. It's just that they won't really talk to each other. Uh, so there, there is something else you can... I'm not sure whether I'm going to bring this up later in the course. So that'll be, You don't necessarily have to use D-amino acids if you want something that's not, that's not digested by the stomach. You can use non-natural amino acids. So rather than picking one of the normal 20 ones, pick something slightly different. And then and there are a handful of amino acids that are quite common to use. You can, for instance, there are lysines, chains of different lengths. And if these amino acids are different enough, they will usually not by, be degraded by the normal enzymes in your stomach, which is good if you want to have a way to administer a drug. OK, more questions. Yep. I mean, all amino acids are charged and physiological pH, but if you mean side chains, then there are three positive and two negative. Okay. Normal ones? So, what do you mean when you say all of them are charged? The um, amino group and the carbon so You're actually right. And in one way, this might be a bad way to pose the question. Uh, so, would you pose this question in a different way? I would rather, how many amino acids have a net charge? Mm -hmm. So a net charge would mean that the entire molecule has a charge that does not sum up to zero. Uh, so what you're talking about is this property that they're Twitter ionic, right? You have two charges in them, but one is positive and one is negative. And that means that the net charge is zero. And, and the problem with that is that that's quite true when the amino acids are isolated. But the second you start putting them in a polypeptide, right? When we form the peptide bonds, those net charges disappear, so they become polar. But so there is no net charge anymore when they're in a protein. But otherwise, uh, your otherwise your answer was quite right. So you mentioned three plus two amino acids. Bring them up again. The names. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, arginine. That's correct. Lysine, histidine, yes, and lysine, arginine, and histidine are what they are. Positive. Positive. Uh, and let's see, there should be some questions somewhere. Yes. We have questions two and three here. Acidic and basic amino acids, they are one of them, but are they acidic or basic? <laughs> so that's, so we have two answers here. Can we have a third? Okay, they're basic. <laughs> uh, the reason for that is, uh, to tell the truth, I keep forgetting this too. Um, the way you should think about this is take a paper and pen, draw the amino acids. So what do we mean when we say that they're basic? They, well, the, the point is they behave like a base or versus they behave like an acid, right? Mm -hmm. I think if you have an acid and a solid in water, what would that group look like? And it's the same for the amino acids. Uh, but I always have to draw these unless it's, of course, and I have memorized it. Uh, and then we also had two others that you mentioned, that the acidic ones that are negatively charged. Okay, that's a, that's a good, that's a good way too. 
The other caveat, you mentioned this in passing very briefly. Is it true that, they're, that they are always charged? So when we say that they're charged, this is usually at pH 7. Uh, and if you change the pH enough, they will become neutral. And there are other amino acids that will become charged. And normally lysine and arginine, they're at virtually any relevant biological condition, they're always going to have a positive charge. And aspartate and glutamate, the opposite, they're always going to have a negative charge. But there is one culprit, one really horrible amino acid to deal with when it comes to charges, and that's histidine. Because the problem is that normal, those of you have taken care by a chem well, in organic chemistry, they, you might know that you talk about this pKa values or something, and that's the point where you start to switch the protonation state. Do you know what this value is for histidine? So the problem is right next to seven. But that value is if the amino acids exist isolated in solution. Well, that's really interesting if you're a pure inorganic chemist or something, but in life science, we talk about these amino acids in proteins. And the second this amino acid exists in a protein, first, you don't have any water around it. You might have a hydrophobic environment. It's bad to have charges in a hydrophobic environment. You might have a positive charge next to it. And then you'd up with something called pKa shifts, meaning that suddenly this point is not at all 6.5 anymore, but it might be like 5 or 8. So the problem is when it comes to histidine, it's virtually impossible to predict exactly where this protein is going to sit. Um, because you have at first, you might have, you might have two protons, you might have one, and when you only have one, it can sit on either side of the histidine. But that doesn't sound like too much of a problem, right? We can determine that with the structure determination method. Which one would you pick? NMR. Why? Um, I know that uh, PKs can be tracked with NMR and also X-ray crystallography doesn't usually see the protons. So the problem is that the X-ray crystallography won't see the hydrogen. <laughs> and that's, that's the only difference between these two states. It depends where you have the hydrogen, right? So why doesn't X-ray crystallography see hydrogens? Well, X-ray crystallography doesn't see any atoms. It uh, sees the electrons. And a hydrogen is typically very, well, a hydrogen typically is not too fond of its electrons. So whenever a hydrogen is bonding to something, it usually donates its electron to the other atom. So normally you have hardly have any electrons around the hydrogen, and that's why X-ray doesn't see it. Neutron scattering, on the other hand, loves to see uh, hydrogens. It scatters very well. Sorry, that was not stuff we covered yesterday. Um, but under, so it actually turns out, Understanding where, uh, how amino acids are titrated and what charges amino acids have, that's super important for lots of cases. And particularly, if you, for instance, if you want a drug that's supposed to pass a cellular membrane or something, you don't want it charged. That's bad. On the other hand, if you're having something like a voltage-gated ion channel, a protein that should somehow be controlled by voltage, what do you need then? Well, what happens, so what happens with every single heartbeat or something in your cell, you have a change in potential. So what's going to happen to a ligand if you change the potential? If you change the electric field? Absolutely nothing. Unless. So if you have an electric field, a charge in an electric field will be subject to a force. So if you change an electric field on a charge, that, you will pull that quite, quite hard actually. So the point is that any time I want a component in a protein or something that should move when I change the field, we need to have it charged. So then we need those charges. But then you end up in a bit of a bind here. So that on the one, if you now have a membrane protein that should change in an electric field, you can't have charges because you want it in the membrane, but you must have charges to get it to move in an electric field. And that's going to be a problem. We'll come back to that when we talk about membrane proteins. All right, do we have more? Yes, we do. What are the levels of structure organizations in proteins? Anybody want to have a go at it? Um, I would, but I can't really say quaternary cu <laughs> structure, primary to quaternary structure. Yes, and what do they represent? Um, primary is the sequence, mm. which is really a structure, kind of a, is a structure. Uh, secondary is lo local, local structure. Oh. In particular, we call, and, uh, and that's, uh, sorry, yes, you said that secondary, sorry. You even said secondary structure, my bad. Tertiary is <laughs> <laughs> uh, each domain, it's bold, and quaternary is the uh, more than one. 
and we'll come back to what these domains mean. Um, the funny thing is that nowadays we have slightly different definitions of domain in bioinformatics and say physical chemistry. In bioinformatics we think of a domain as something that's evolving independently. While in the terms of protein structure you typically think of a domain as something that folds independently. So you remember the, well, no, we have other questions about that. So in 99% of cases they're roughly the same but there are a couple of exceptions. Good. We have more questions. Okay. That, uh, I think the further models, they always had uh, three strands mm -hmm. of uh, nucleic acid, and I think they uh, say that it, the bases are on the inside and uh, the phosphatic acids are on the outside, and that they, they say that's the salt and not the acid. That Yes, yeah, so the, those were really important findings, and I, that's very much related to the key findings. So when I say the key finding, this leads to something. Uh, so that they propose that there is a specific pairing of the bases that corresponds to the number of hydrogen bonds, right? So that you have A, G, C, and T, and A and T pair and G and C pair, but they can't pair any other way. And this, of course, when you have the specific pairing, this immediately leads to a proposed copying mechanism for the genetic material. You can split them, but then when they need to pair up, they can, there is a, for each base, there is only one other free base that it can pair with. And that's really, the funny thing is that they didn't really, this was an observation that people had very early on, that there appears to be the same amount of A and T in DNA, and there appears to be the same amount in G and C. But nobody really drew this conclusion until they saw the structure. And I think this is, it's important to realize, we just saw the polling structure yesterday, and it's so easy in hindsight to say that something is stupid while something else is so obvious. There were a number of amazingly smart researchers. They had the results. They saw that it was exactly the same amount of AT and GC, but nobody thought that this is, this is going to change everything in the 20th century about molecular biology. So remember that I, I asked another, another question in yesterday's lecture. Why did it take nine years for Watson and Crick to get the Nobel Prize? from the time they published their paper in 53 until they got the prize in 62. It's obviously not something you're gonna read online. So the paper was published in already in 1953. This is an important lesson, so that, again, this is not the leak, uh, but so the, the, uh, all the, the secrecy has been lifted since it's more than 50 years ago, and there are a couple of professors in the Royal Academy of Sciences that have looked into this, and I think they're writing a book about it now even. It turned out they were not even nominated until 1960. And uh, that's another one of these results. Science, we usually think of science in hindsight. It actually took seven years for anybody to realize that, hey, this might be a pretty important result. And today we think that it's obviously one of the most important results in life science in the 20th century. It took seven years for anybody to even notice. Or not notice, people of course cited the paper and people in the narrow field felt it was really important. But the impact of DNA wasn't really obvious. Then, of course, 10 years later, when we had the genetic code and we started doing molecular biology and everything, nowadays it's obvious, but science does not happen in hindsight. And that's, I think, what you should think of now when it comes to choosing diploma work, well, so summer projects, thesis works, PhD studies and everything. It's very easy to be seduced by whatever is hottest right now. Then neither Watson or Crick would have founded molecular biology. It's important to dare to go to the white spots in the map, and they are rarely obvious. Uh, more things. Mm, question, I guess it's 14 or 15, what did Amphinsen and Levinton mm -hmm. say? So Amphinsen said that proteins fall into one single uh, yeah, global minimum in the uh, free energy, in the free energy landscape. And Levinton said that, uh, yeah, how can this happen uh, if there are so many combinations? So I, that's quite right. I would just like to defend Levin Cyrus a little bit. Um, so Cyrus formulated that this is obviously a paradox. It's not that he disagreed. He agreed with uh, Christian, but realized there is something here we do not understand. Because obviously they fold, but we can't explain that simple from the laws of physics. All right, other stuff? 
uh, phi, psi, omega, and chi. Omega is the peptide bonding. Yes. And that is by far the least important of those angles. Uh, uh, you're forgetting one. There has to be four atoms in a torsion. Okay. And now you're doing this the really difficult way. <laughs> because when you start, I start to think which atom is which. Don't try to think of those in there. Which one, which one is phi? That's the, bond just be, that's the bond just before the C alpha. And if I need to know those atom names, I will draw it on paper. Mm. And then phi is the other one. Yes. <laughs> and chi is the side chain. Yes. And the, the reason why I just write chi here is that chi 1 would be the first bond directly after the alpha carbon and then chi 2 and chi 3. But the further out you are, the less impact you have on the rotation, right? So the first chi, the first chi angle has a fairly major impact. And when it comes to predicting side chains, for instance, normally we measure how well we're predicting chi 1. That's important. You occasionally measure how well you're predicting chi 2 and further out than chi 2. We don't really care about it. And the reason for that at chi 3 or something is typically just a matter of rotating an NH3 or a CH3 group or something. It's not really important for structure. Water, we're going to, we can actually skip water because I'm going to talk more about that today and tomorrow. Um, since we talked about these angles, how do you define a dihedral or torsion angle? Depends on who you are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that's when it comes to the actual angle. I think the, the point is, uh, if we forget about the two alternative definitions, so what's, it's an angle, but what type of angle is it? So three um, atoms define a plane, and then so um, if you have four atoms, the first three and the last three define a plane, and the angle between exactly. those plan, planes is the diagonal. So typically this corresponds to rotation around a bond, although in principle, any time you have four points, you can define a torsion. And that's right, so which ones are the most important degrees of freedom in a protein? Why? Ha, I didn't expect that follow-up. <laughs> Do you have some degree of freedom? Um, yes, but maybe, so start with the others. Why are, for instance, bonds and angles, they're obvious degrees of freedom. Why are they not important? Or they are important, but why are they not relevant for protein structure? Bonds are hardly at all excited at 300 Kelvin and angles might vary a couple of degrees. While the torsion degrees of freedoms, these energy variations are weak enough that it becomes relevant. They can actually change. Mm -hmm. And cis and trans is what or what? The trans is when they're on opposite side, two large groups on opposite side of a bond and cis when they're on the same. And so what type of energies do we typically talk about in proteins? AT. No. Yes. Typical energies. And that's something we're going to come back to today. So that's a very high energy. I wouldn't say that that's a typical energy in a protein. So what, roughly, what type of energy is that? Uh, so that would be an electrostatic energy of two charges separated just by one angstrom. Typically, charges won't get that close to each other. So that would be an extreme. That's a type of energy that will never, that's a type of bond that would never, ever break, a covalent bond or something. So the typical energies we relate to in protein, by far, if there's one energy you should remember, it's roughly how much is the energy of a hydrogen bond. And that is related to why water is such an important molecule in life. Five what? K cal, yes. So it's important that the units, right? And sadly, there's both K cal and kilojoules. You can use whatever you want, but don't mix them up. This is a relatively high energy. Normally, it will be formed, but it's weak enough that we can occasionally break it. And we will come back to later that the typical stabilization energy of a protein is in the order not just one hydrogen bond, but maybe 10 or so, almost regardless of the size of a protein. So they're not the stabilization energies of proteins are fairly low. Uh, and finally, one thing that is just fun to what is post translational modification, since we talked so much about folding? I mentioned that briefly yesterday. 
Yes, and by structure here, this usually means that you're modifying an amino acid or something that you might be binding. Typically, it has to be glycosylation or things like that. Occasionally, it can be binding a cofactor. Um, a hemoglobin, for instance, need to have the heme group bound, but the heme group is, it doesn't consist of amino acids. You first, you fold the protein, but while the protein is folded, you need to insert this other group. Sorry? Insulin changes. So insulin is a very special molecule. Uh, so what, what insulin does is that the chain is actually cut. So insulin, the funny thing is that many, insulin was the first protein ever sequenced uh, by Fred Sanger. So insulin actually cons is cut so that it consists of two chains. Uh, so the small molecule actually has two parts of it. And the, the funny thing, just as I mentioned that it was a fun coincidence that we got the first two structures was hemoglobin and myoglobin that were so closely related. Um, I think it was just a coincidence that Fred Sanger started working on insulin. It wasn't specifically because of that, but yes, insulin is special in that way. Uh, but there are many molecules that have cuts and in particular for higher organisms when genes are separated in introns and exons. Uh, and I will come back to that. We talk about structure. That's, is there anything else you wanted to ask about? related to yesterday or, or to bring up that we should discuss. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that the folding and the calling in 1951, they found the helix by man. But is there any software so far that predicts uh, the helix uh, by man? Sorry, that they predicted the helix by, by math? Um, in, well, in, yes, in principle, I would say it's math. I, I think it was mostly paper and pen, though, that they said, just as Watson and Crick did, what you frequently did, since you didn't have computers in those days, we were frequently sitting and working with molecular models. And then you realize a molecular model is actually a beautiful, well, before we had computers, it's a beautiful way to see what, rama, what torsions, fine psi, for instance, are allowed. Even I, when I was a student, we had a lab in Lund University in the south of Sweden where we sat and did this and see what regions in the Ramachandran diagram are allowed. So what they did is, of course, they started by seeing what is allowed, um, and then they started for the regions that are allowed, are there some confirmations that are more favorable than others? And I, I would, my hunch would be that the alpha helix is likely the structure they found first, because it's a regular structure, it's one that's allowed, it makes it very compact, and then you can form all these hydrogen bonds. Now, the second you've done this, you can, of course, start to show that this structure you proposed is better than all the other ones you've listed. Beta sheets is a, I would actually argue that beta sheets is a harder structure to predict because beta sheets, the individual strand is simpler, but then you need to start to making assumptions about global protein structures, how proteins would fold in general. Just from the point of view of a simple molecule, and remember, we didn't have protein structures when they did this from the terms of a simple molecule that somehow folds upon itself. An alpha helix is a much more reasonable, predictable structure. The beta strands, although the individual strand is simpler, it's a more amazing prediction. But so it's, yes, half math, because they of course showed the energetics, but also just half paper and pen and sitting with a model, uh, model and realize what's possible. Sure, uh, although that's not that common. So the problem with alpha helices is they're so common that uh, for you, you rarely see prolines in alpha helices. And remember in 1951, it, it's not like today when we had whole databases of sequences or anything. Fred Sanger's invention was roughly at the same time, right? So we didn't really have sequences for most proteins. Uh, we knew that what the average amino acid compositions of them were, but we had no idea about what order the amino acids were in, and we didn't even realize uh, that, well, Fred, Fred, Fred Sanger's result, that there is a unique sequence to each protein that is conserved. Uh, remember that it's easier to think that people, it's just 60 years ago, and it's so easy to think that people knew much more than they did, that it's a fairly young science. Good. Um, I will, there is one plot that I found on the internet a while ago. When it comes to amino acids, I, I kind of like this way. Um, you, don't, you don't need to you know, know this by heart, but the point is there is more than one way to skin a cat. And when it comes to amino acids, there are lots of ways you can divide these. Proline is all pretty much always unique, but then you can say things that are amino acids that are aliphatic. That is the one that do not contain um, benzene-derived groups. 
Uh, there are polar ones. There are somewhat there are aromatic groups that phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine in particular. Um, there are ones that are tiny. There are ones that are charged, negative, positive, polar, nonpolar, meaning hydrophobic. You should be aware of a bunch of these classifications and just that you can probably come up with one or two other ones if you wanted to, for instance, their hydrogen bond properties or something. And this is, of course, how nature uses this, that you need to find a building block that fits. But apart from proline, they are typically not unique. So in this case, if you have a location in your protein where leucine fits very well, isoleucine is likely also going to fit very well. Glutamine, on the other hand, likely not, right? And if you have a tryptophan and replacing that for a proline, that's likely also going to destroy your structure. You're probably really aware of this because you have studied this in bioinformatics. But again, when people first started classifying amino acid, they didn't have the sequence databases that we have nowadays. The other thing that we talked about yesterday was these Ramachandran diagrams, but I realized I didn't really tell you. I didn't tell you what is what in the Ramachandran diagrams. Uh, and we have these two big regions, and these regions correspond to beta sheets up on the left, and then the right-handed alpha helix down here in the middle. And then we actually have this left-handed alpha helix over there, but you see the relative population. That one is so small that you can pretty much forget about it. Uh, I can't, uh, there is always a rule that confirms, uh, there's always an exception that confirms the rule in biology, but I can't, of, I can't immediately think of any relevant left-handed alpha helix in any structure that I worked with. So yeah, it's, it's a curiosity and uh, I think it's a popular question, both in tests and everything, to say, why are alpha helices always right-handed? And that has nothing to do with the Ramachandran. Well, it has things to do with the Ramachandran diagram, but that comes from the chirality. It does not come from the fact that it's chance or anything. Does that mean that beta sheets are more common, or just that there's more possible So I think this is... No, so that first, the, um, the points here, this is likely just for one protein or something that this is not representative of everything in the database. Um, it's actually a very good question. I would argue that alpha helices and beta sheets have roughly the same uh, prevalence for globular proteins. When it comes to membrane proteins, alpha helices are much more common than beta sheets. The danger here, though, is that nowadays we have enough bioinformatics to be able to predict that this is true. A permanent danger in biology is that we're always biased by what we've seen this far. And in particular for membrane proteins early on, it was easier to determine alpha helical structures. And if you can only determine alpha helical structures well, suddenly you can end up with lots of structures and they're all alpha helical. And then it's very easy to say that by definition, all membrane proteins are alpha helical. That's not true. That's just because we had, it was difficult to determine the beta sheet ones. And now we have some beta sheet ones. Um, for structure, I would still say that it's whole, but it's, it's very important to be aware of our bias in the structure determined methods, for instance. We only see what we can see. My plan for today is that we're going to have a little bit of fun. I'm going to show you some movies first. Uh, and then we're going to talk about interactions in proteins. So if you felt that there was a torrent of slides yesterday, for better or worse, we're going to have much fewer slides today. I'm going to bring up this comp the concept of Sebe empiric modeling, and part of the interactions is going to be repetition from yesterday, and that's quite intentional. This leads to some deep questions about how should we model nature in general? Is quantum mechanics always the answer in life and biology? Um, I will, well, the partial charges are probably part of the interactions. I touched upon them yesterday. And then we're going to dig a bit deeper into these fundamental properties of proteins. And then after the break, we're going to have fun because then we're going to start having some, I wouldn't say hard physics, but there's likely going to be more equations than you've had previously in these master's programs. So I'm going to start talking about energies, energy landscapes, and in particular, statistical mechanics and the Boltzmann distribution. I predict that some of you are going to think that this is a bit difficult in the maths, and that's why I have fewer slides today. We will take the time we need for this. If there's one thing I can recommend you, if you don't follow me, stop me, and we'll take it again. Don't think that you will read this up tonight at home or something. It's not going to be easier for you to do this on yourself. Um, the good news is that the second part of this slide is going to be a little bit of math. And then sometime after Easter, there's going to be one more lecture when I actually drive this in the general case. And then it's going to be even more math. But normally, we're going to have less math than we have in this parts. 
The funny thing though is that this will enable us to predict some pretty remarkable things about proteins and actually not just proteins, life molecules in general. This is some extremely powerful methods from physics. And then I'm just going to tempt your appetite a little bit with entropy and free energy. Uh, we will come back to that tomorrow. So if you don't follow me here, focus on the Boltzmann distribution. Because that's also what we're going to do in the lab this afternoon. So let's see if you can catch what this is. This is an old movie. So Ken Drew, remember that that was the guy at LMB who got the Nobel Prize for the molecule? So how old do you think this movie is first? So do, you, do, you, do you see the molecule in there? So that's the prosthetic group. That's the molecule that actually binds the oxygen. Oh, sorry, this is the molecule that binds the iron that in turn binds the oxygen. So this is, if I recall, 1966. And the computers we had at that time was, this is a short movie. It's not quite the type of graphics you have on your phones or something today. Let's see if I, th I think I should have one more here. Lysosine, another small molecule. So these are not even simulations or anything. These are just rendered images where you try to trace out the backbone of these molecules. And the reason why people were so amazed with this is that the regularity of these, and again, to you this is likely obvious, but in the 1960s, people were simply so stunned by the fact that you had these regular but extremely complicated structures in life molecules. So this was done by, most of this work was done by a computer geek uh, who sat down and worked on a Mac, actually. That computer geek in question. So a Mac at the time was a slightly different type of Mac. It's a multi-axis computer. So this is the computer. To date, I'm still not quite sure what this is, but I think it's, it's not really a mouse, but it's something that you use to control the screen here. So you don't really have a keyboard. So that is the keyboard and how you program the machine. Um, and then typically you somewhere you should have a punch card system. So the way you would normally program these is that you would have, you would use Fortran and then you would write these programs on punch cards. Uh, sorry, you would write the programs and you would translate them to punch card code. And then you would put an entire stack of cards in a card reader and the machine would then interpret this holes pretty much you do with chat, well, pretty much what you do with automated pull stations or something today and turn that into computer code. And one of my mentors, Mike Levitt, he worked not on exactly this type of machine. He at one point mentioned that you learn very quickly. So when you had your stack of cards, which could be like two, 300 cards, the first time you fell and dropped these cards, you learned that it's very important to draw a diagonal line on the side of the cards so you can put them in the right order again. <laughs> because otherwise you had to go back and redo everything. And these were the days, access to these computers, it was not a matter of doing up and doing a lab. As a student, Mike mentioned that he used to, you, you used to be happy if you could get access like at 3 a.m. in the morning or something, and then you could have a couple of hours of time on the computer. And this is likely one thousandth of the power of your iPhone. Um, the cool thing is that that computer geek was Cyrus Leventhal. Um, so you think of these people as old gray-haired professors, right? Uh, but Cyrus too was young at one point in time. And Cyrus was one of the first people, oh you actually see a view, one of the molecules there. Uh, so Cyrus was one of the first people to sit down and work on modeling of proteins by computers. Not simulations, just drawing the structures. And there is a famous paper in Scientific American in 1966, which is really hard to get online. So a couple of years ago, I went down to a library and dug up all the old issues of Scientific American and copied this. I have a PDF on the website, uh, at least of those of you who are logged in or not. And I guess since 1966, technically the copyright has probably expired. Well, it's, the copyright has expired, so it's exactly 50 years ago. So I think I'm fine there. Uh, it's well worth reading. It's like Scientific American, it's popular science. In the 1960s, Scientific American was a beautiful paper because popular science today, well, popular science in the 1960s would probably be considered real science by many today. It's a paper written by scientists for scientists, but in different areas. It's well worth reading. So if that was the amusing part, um, I'm going to go through it. There's one concept that the Brook brings up, and when it comes to bonds, it's not going to be the main topic of the course, but I want to spend two slides on it anyway, because it might help you later. Um, 
And it's related to these things I mentioned about quantum chemistry. You're not going to be doing, you're hardly going to be doing any quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry in this course. Actually, scratch that. You will not be doing any. But occasionally, it's good to think about what are the limits of classical, the way we describe things classically, and when do we need quantum chemistry. So in general, understanding how electrons move is really complicated. You can't describe how an electron moves. You can only describe probabilities. Think of these as electron clouds. And the only way to really formally correctly determine what happens is that write down the wave equations, solve them. If there's one electron, you can solve it manually. Otherwise, you're going to need a computer. And then you're going to need to optimize this to find what is the most advantageous state from an energy point of view, meaning the lowest energy. And that's going to be the states the two molecules, well, the electrons want to adopt. That it becomes really complicated and we're not going to use computers. So there are some ways we can actually think about this. You're probably, some of you might, well, you should probably be aware of this. You can think of electrons as different shells, right? You have two electrons in the innermost shells and then six more. And you can think of this something called valence bond theory that I didn't write down here. And the idea that you might remember is that atoms like, atoms rather the electrons likes to be in full shells. And you can formulate this in the concept called orbitals. So the first shell just corresponds to an electron that is completely uniformly divided around the protein. Technically, that's just one shell. But then electrons have a property called spin that you don't need to know anything about. But think of it as an arrow up or arrow down. And since you can have one electron pointing up and one electron pointing down in this shell, that gives us two electrons. There's actually a very deep concept in quantum chemistry called the Pauli exclusion principle that says two identical electrons, and it's not even electrons, but it's fermions, particles that have this spin property, cannot occupy the same quantum state simultaneously. So if they have two in this state, one of them needs to spin up, and another one needs to spin down. If you take two such green balls and try to push them really close together, well, if both of them have two electrons, they're going to repel each other really forcefully. And you can show that's an exponential repulsion if you go through all the math in quantum mechanics. So that the Pauli exclusion principle is really the explanation why all atoms start to repel each other at some point if you push them too hard together. That's why you get very high energies. But if you have an atom, say like a hydrogen, that just has one electron here, it's going to be in the S state and have one electron pointing up. If you take two such hydrogens and move them together, one opportunity for these electrons is to have one electron pointing up and the other one pretty much reverses direction. And then you're gonna have two atoms, but each of these atoms will feel as if it had a full electron shell. So you're now gonna have both these electrons being happy together, one would spin up and one would spin down. Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you about the quantum mechanical part here. But the idea here is that under some circumstances, the way we pair these electrons, if we can make multiple atoms feel as if they have full shells, we will form chemical bonds. And that's really, that's really the main concept behind these so-called valence bond theory, that if you get these orbitals overlapping, and if they or, uh, overlap in a good way, one up and one down, we form a covalent bond. This becomes more complicated if we start looking at this stuff that I had on the previous slide, this p orbitals, one, two, three, uh, because at some point you start having mixing between these orbitals, and that's why you have larger, larger atoms such as carbon that they can bind up to four atoms. So what happens around an alpha carbon, for instance, when you bind four atoms, you actually get one s and the three p orbitals to mix. I might have, there might say sp3 hybrid, hybridization on some slide. What I'm really saying by that is that these four orbitals, they share the load so that you can bind four other atoms from your carbon. So why do I keep bringing this up? Uh, well, the electrons, this means that the electrons are responsible for two or three things. First, they're responsible that saturated orbitals, due to this Pauli exclusion principle, they explain why all atoms repel each other if you push them close enough. And even if you didn't have an atom, if you were to push them even further, at some point you're going to have the protons and neutrons inside the chain repelling each other, the protons in particular. But the, same, the very same electrons in this case, they also explain why we can form covalent bonds. It's pure quantum mechanics. And at this point, we should start getting really worried because if we're going to need to understand these interactions, we should just change the topic of the course. We should spend the next four weeks going through quantum mechanics. 
So what happens if we for a second ignore that? Uh, go to very large distances. Yes, well in general atoms will interact with each other, but how do they interact? Oh, sorry, they attract each other. Um, well, yes and no. Yeah, in, in principle, you're right. So first thing is, this depends on the charge. If you have things like two positive ions, right, they're going to repel each other. That's simple. That's electrostatic. So we'll hang on with that for a while. But if any normal atom that is not charged, at large distances, to first approximation, we just say that they don't interact, right? Because they don't have charges or anything. But if you think of a small atom like water, remember what I said yesterday, that water has a very large negative charge here and positive charge here. So this is a dipole. I just usually draw it at an arrow pointing that way. Now, if this, atom, this, this water molecule is interacting with another atom like xenon, charged, non-charged, the first approximation, that shouldn't be anything. But the xenon is not a point. The xenon consists of A, a nucleus, and B, electrons. So what this and the nucleus here is quite heavy, why the electrons hardly weigh anything. So what's going to happen here? Our negatively charged oxygen is going to do what to the electrons? No. What's the charge in the oxygen? Negative. So what will the oxygen try to do? So if we take all the electrons on the xenon and push those slightly to your right, and while the nucleus, and uh, slightly now, we, we're, we're talking about tiny fractions of the radius here, right? So if we take all these electrons and push them slightly away, this is going to be somewhat better. We can't push them too far away because these electrons will also be happy to interact with the nucleus in the xenon, which is positively charged. So then you have a xenon with a positively charged nucleus here, and the electrons push slightly to the right. But hang on a second. That's just what we had in the water. So if you have the positive and negative charges no longer centered on each other, suddenly we now have a dipole here too. So one dipole will induce another dipole in the second atom here. And that's occasion what we call dipole to induced dipole interaction. The only reason for bringing that up first is to get to the second point, because it gets more complicated. So if we have, assuming that this is, let's imagine that these are xenons. Um, so they're, that's why they're the same color here. At finite temperature, things move, in particular the electrons. The electrons are always more mobile than the uh, nuclei. So these electrons, at some point, they will fluctuate. And at some point, these electrons will be slightly to the left here. And then we spontaneously have a small dipole formed here. Now this temporary dipole, which is tiny, now, well, now I have a dipole, and then I have the phenomenon up here, right? So this temporary dipole will induce another dipole in the second atom. That's one way of thinking about it. The book does something slightly different. You can also, if we started by having these conformations, if we start imagining that we had these electrons right on top of everything here, what happens if I take all these three sets of electrons and move them slightly to the left, as I've done here? Well, there are two parts of it. What happens to the interactions from charge to charge to charge? Does that change? No, nothing changes because they're the same relative distance. What happens with the interactions from those electrons to those electrons to those electrons? Nothing, because they're the same distance. But what happens to the interactions between the positive charge, negative electron, positive charge, negative electron, and positive charge? They're slightly better, right? Because suddenly you have the electrons right between two positive charges, and that positive charge will be right between two electrons. You can think of it any way you want. Um, this you can actually derive. You don't need quantum mechanics for this. This is just small dipoles and uh, purely classical electrostatics. And this was proved by London that this is proportional to the sixth inverse power of the distance, and it's called dispersion. Is this important? Can you imagine anywhere in life where this is relevant? In no, well, I know. I wasn't. You can certainly think about it in proteins. I wasn't thinking about proteins. Something much more fundamental. If you think about a noble gas, so what do you know about noble gases? Yes, which means 
Yes, and that you can formulate now that they don't, they don't react or interact with anything, right? So if, what, do you know at what temperature helium becomes a liquid? No, a, a, well, negative 200 Kelvin doesn't exist. <laughs> a, a couple of Kelvin, I think it's usually four Kelvin or so. But that's strange. Why does something become a liquid? Because of interaction, but we just said that it's a noble gas and they don't interact. The reasons why even noble gases eventually become liquids are because of dispersion interactions. But these are, ex it might tell you something that it happens at 4 Kelvin. These are extremely weak forces. They're so weak that they're only really relevant when almost all motion in the system has ceased. So that's why noble gases only condense when you're at a couple of Kelvin. That seems completely irrelevant. Why do I even bother bringing this up? These are the kind of interactions that appear in uh, non-polar molecules. Yes, if you don't have any charges, these are the only interactions we have. Uh, and the other thing that while each of these interactions is weak, if you have one atom surround, if you have one atom interacting with one other atom, is not really important. Not with two, but an atom interacts with hundreds or thousands of atoms around it, right? Normally, that in electrostatics, that would be relevant. Because if you have one atom interacting with the first atom, that's an attractive force. So the second atom might be the opposite sign. So let's just guess that's a repulsive force. So the sign of electrostatic interactions fluctuates. It's sometimes attractive, sometimes repulsive. What is the sign of these interactions? Attractive or repulsive? They're always attractive, right? So it's small, but if you sum up enough of these, no matter how small it is, if you sum up enough of them, eventually it will become important. Well, with electrostatics, you never know. Um, it can be the net results of many particles interacting with electrostatic can be either repulsive or attractive. The other thing you should be aware of, the larger an atom is, the larger its electron cloud is, and the easier it is to deform the electron cloud. And that's why larger atoms tend to have stronger dispersion interactions. So that friend of order would just say that sadly we're going to need to change the topic of the course and turn this into a quantum chemistry course. Um, the only problem is that there are, and, and formally that's correct, right? That we just described a whole bunch of things that you need quantum chemistry to treat really accurately. The only problem is that there are compromises in life and that includes quantum chemistry. Uh, quantum chemistry does something beautifully. When I was roughly your age, I remember having a teacher speaking that it was so amazing because we could now determine the electron structure of benzene, six atoms. Now, there are a lot more than six electrons in that molecule, and you probably know what the structure of benzene is, so that the fact that a computer could also tell us where the electrons are, from a fundamental science point of view, it's important, but it doesn't really teach us a whole lot about benzene. Computers are a lot faster today. Today you can handle roughly 100 atoms. And if that doesn't sound like such an amazing uh, advance in like the, 30, well, the 25 years since I was your age, this is because quantum chemistry scales really bad. Normally in chemistry, if you have 10 times as many of something, it would be 10 times costly. Quantum chemistry typically scales to the fifth or fifth power <laughs> or so. So if you, have, if you go from 10 ad one atom to 10 atoms, or electrons, it would be something like 100,000 times more expensive. And that's roughly how much faster computers have gotten. So the problem, I don't know about you, but there are not a whole lot of interesting proteins of this size. But that's a, that's a false argument. I can't say that just because I would like to study proteins, I'm going to study proteins with sloppy methods because the correct methods I can't handle. That's kind of irrelevant, right? We're not going to teach anything about proteins. It's not really valid. Uh, the other problem is that, did I say that the quantum mechanics I briefly described, that's completely false. Because we kind of just assume that we can study the electrons while the atoms don't move. To do this correctly, you should of course use a time-dependent relativistic Schrodinger equation. The good news for that is that it's possible to solve that one for one electron. And suddenly, well, the, the good news, we can do really well if you study either a hydrogen atom or a helium plus ion. But that's pretty much it. Computers can do a slightly better job, but we're limited to picoseconds of time. So 
So that forget about life science, it's not even chemistry, it's physics. But same thing there, if that was really important, it would not be a valid counterargument. The other problem though is that when we study these, it's not just a matter of what we want to study in our atoms. Uh, what you typically do with quantum chemistry, if we assume that the cores don't move, if we don't have any atoms moving, you're studying things at zero Kelvin. And I always just start to become a bit worried, right? This is the so-called better method. Life science at zero Kelvin. The other part, those hundred atoms, we're kind of forgetting something. We're going to need water. So are you serious? You're going to study life science in vacuum? So the problem, this is by no means, this does by no means mean that quantum chemistry is bad. Quantum chemistry is a really important method. The problem is that the compromises this brings, that quantum chemistry is a beautiful way of treating the interactions in these systems really accurately, but there are some pretty hard compromises we would do and people still do in quantum chemistry, and that's why we're typically not going to use it. Now, all these arguments, at least the first few ones here, would be false if we absolutely needed quantum chemistry for that, but just because quantum chemistry can describe something, or quantum mechanics, that doesn't mean that you have to use quantum mechanics for it. And in fact, as you see on the slide, this system too is really well described by quantum mechanics. I'm not sure about you, but my kids usually don't use quantum mechanics to predict how a football is going to move. Uh, same thing, if I go through this door, technically I diffract a little bit because I'm going through a slit. Now the slit is not so thin, so I don't really, it's not really going to influence my life that my atoms start to diffract, but technically I do diffract a little bit. And this has to do with this complicated concept. We need to focus on the most important part of a system. And it turns out, typically for proteins, these large molecules, with a few exceptions, if you form or break bonds, you need quantum chemistry to describe that. But remember what we told yesterday, bonds don't usually even vibrate a whole lot at 300 Kelvin. So for all practical purposes, if we're going to study proteins, a protein at room temperature is more like a football. It's important to have the water around it. It's important to account for the fact that proteins actually do move. The exact quantum chemical interactions of the protein, we can usually ignore a bit. And I think the conclusion of this is really that quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, they really describe things on very different scales of length, time, resolution, and everything. Uh, this is a funny slide that the Nobel Committee had a couple of years ago. You frequently use a cat to describe quantum chemistry uh, based on Schrodinger's cat. That is duality, where the cat is both alive and dead in the box. And this is, of course, Isaac Newton. Uh, and you can think of this as competing theories and everything, but in particular modern science, I think we tend to ignore the beauty of Isaac Newton. There is no question that quantum mechanics is a more detailed theory in a way. What I find beautiful with Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton managed to develop, describe the world in a way that five-year-olds can understand it. Have you ever thought about the concept of a force? A force doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a force. You can think in terms of potential energies or something, but the force is really just Isaac Newton's way of describing how things interact. And any five-year-old will have a grasp of force if you push something. And okay, we, we forget the beauty of simple models, and Newton's equations and Newton's mechanics is one of the most simple and beautiful models there is in history, and that's why we're largely going to use it. The problem, though, is that in some cases, in particular enzymes or so, you really need quantum, uh, quantum mechanics, so that there were a couple of groups in Israel, in particular, that uh, started to look into this in the 1960s. I'm sorry, I think I might have screwed up the order in which I build this slide. Yes, sorry. Uh, the problem with quantum mechanics is really that you can derive all these parameters and we could sometimes try to derive the charges and everything from quantum mechanics and just extrapolate. But extrapolating, this would this would be like me trying to point out the location of the George Washington Monument in DC from this room. It's roughly in that direction. But if I point here, I might as well point to Mexico City. And that's if you, what we're trying to do here. If you extrapolate 15 orders of magnitude, you're going to be wrong. It doesn't matter what theory you use. So that's not really going to work. And then there was a group by Schneer Lifson uh, at uh, Rehovot in Israel, small group. He had, Schneer had one student working from Ari Orschel, who sat down and started to look into this, that are there alternative ways we can describe this? And Ari really started with quantum mechanics. But one of the beautiful things they realized is that you don't need to use quantum mechanics for the entire system. In their particular case, they looked at enzymes. 
and that the very specific binding site you need quantum mechanics, but for the rest of the protein that doesn't form or break bonds, you can use something much simpler. But the much simpler thing will kill you when you extrapolate. So they realize that you can cheat. Because sometimes in life you're allowed to cheat. So one way could of course be to, that I try to do the world's most accurate quantum chemistry calculation to determine the parameters of a water molecule so that I will reproduce the specific heat and density of water. That would be an amazing calculation, right? But why on earth should I do that calculation? We know what the specific heat and density of water is. We can measure it in the lab in 10 minutes. So why do you try to use a computer for something we already know? So their idea was this really what you call semi-empiric models is that fit these parameters instead. And that's what I mean by cheating, that we already know the results. To adapt the parameters so that we will get the density and heat of vaporization of these molecules. And this was really the beginning of all modern molecular modeling that you could suddenly treat large, gigantic systems. Uh, and I would argue that one of the most important results that this really made it possible to explain how enzymes work that we understood enzymes is mostly about electrostatics. And what I mentioned briefly yesterday, that an enzyme binds the, binds the components we need in the equation so that they can somehow form or break a bond. We reduce the energy of that highest barrier we need to get over, and then we release the product again. And this was clearly Ari in particular who showed in his really early work. And they got the Nobel Prize together with Martin Karplus actually a couple of years ago. Martin is the one who pioneered simulations and molecular studies of proteins. It's very fun. Mike is my, actually my old postdoc advisor. It's, it's very strange when you realize in the middle of the night that your postdoc advisor got the Nobel Prize. I've never thought of Mike. He's an amazing smart person. Mm -hmm. One of the nicest people, but I've never thought of him as a Nobel Prize winner. And I don't even sure if he himself thinks of himself as a Nobel Prize winner anymore. Um, but this led, if we start accepting this issue with some sort of not fake, but fitted parameterizations, all these complicated things with electron clouds moving and everything, we can start to describe that in terms of rather than having electron clouds that are offset, we can say that on average you have a slightly larger point charge in this particle and a point charge which is positive on the hydrogen. This is of course wrong. These are not point-like particles. These are electron distributions. But if we have them as point-like particles with some non-unit charge, we can treat this with classical methods. And in a benzene, so water has very high partial charges and something like benzene here, you see it has very low partial charges. It's a largely, largely hydrophobic molecule. So that was one part. Now we can, at least we've gotten away from the worst part of all the electrons, right? We can describe the, how charges, partial charges allows us to describe the distribution of electrons without using quantum mechanics. There is another part called bond stretching. Um, so if we look at a small bond here between two carbons, for instance, in principle, this is really complicated because you should have the, the blue potential here is what's called the Morse potential that you can't get very close. And at very large distance, eventually the atoms are going to release and unbind. But that's not even enough because it's also a quantum mechanical oscillator. So it's not a classical oscillator along the blue curve, but in principle, you have these discrete energy levels that are that you can be determined with quantum chemistry where the molecules should be placed. But remember what I said that normally on average, these things are not excited at room temperature. So typically at room temperature, we're going to be there. And then we can do a plain, simple harmonic approximation, the green curve here, just assume that this is a second order potential. Sure, if we start to having, if you start to simulate, if you start to examine these molecules at a thousand or two thousand Kelvin, then you start making errors here. But at 300 Kelvin, forget about it. It's a beautiful approximation. In fact, the best approximation would likely be to just have a small stiff rod and not allow them to move at all. So this is a solved problem. We don't need quantum mechanics for bond stretching. Angle vibrations, roughly the same. As I mentioned yesterday, these can move a little bit, a couple of degrees. But you don't need quantum mechanics to describe that. Uh, we can use a classical simple spring function. Um, it's not a perfect approximation at 300 Kelvin, but pretty darn close. Um, so they move a couple of degrees. Solve problem. We don't need to worry about it. You're pretty much never going to worry about bonds or angles in a protein. And the third part are these torsions or dihedral angles. 
these are considerably more complicated because it's not just a matter of getting a ground state, right? right? These are the important degrees of freedom that the energies are so low that they actually do move and we've talked about the definition. So the fact that they are easy to alter is good in a way, but because they are easy to alter, it's not just enough for us to describe them well in the ground state. We need to have a reasonably good description of what happens when they are in other states. And you can describe that in a fairly simple potential. Um, just use a sine or cosine function. A very tiny molecule like ethane, so CH3, CH3. If you have the points where these hydrogens are placed right next to each other are going to be a bit bad, a high. And the points where they are facing in different directions, they're going to be much better energy-wise. The energy for this, the peak here, is roughly 3 kilocalories per mole. So it's a much, much, much... Remember the 300 kilocalories per mole we mentioned for electrostatics? This is a tiny energy. So this is going to be relevant. The molecule would be happier there, but we will occasionally also see it there. Let's see, I think I can start a movie here. Yes, so this is butane. This is a much more complicated molecule because you have two large carbons here. So here we are in the trans state, that's going to be really good. And then eventually you're going to go through a bunch of different states until we end up back in the cis state when these two carbons are on the same side and that's going to be pretty bad. So here you have a trans state here, which is by far the best. And then you go through a somewhat bad state. You find a somewhat better state again. And then you go through the really bad state here. So, but here too, you have energies that are in the bulk of a one to four or five kilocalories per mole. So all of them are still fairly low. So this was one single torsion in a tiny molecule. We have more than a protein. So they, Occasionally, if you have the simplest polypeptide we can imagine, that would be an alanine that just has some groups so that we have one phi and one psi bond. And then we can draw this in a Ramachandran diagram, phi and psi. And here we have colored it. So red here means really bad energy and blue means really low energy. Technically, this is actually free energy than energy. For now, you can think of this as energy. We will come back to the free energy after the break. And here you have one really good state and another really good state. And the differences between these, to go from one of these states to another, you have to go through a peak here that's a couple of kilocalories lower, and then you go down in a different well on the other side. And these are actually the pictures of both of these reasonably good states. This is the best, and this one is slightly higher energy. But you're never going to be up here. We will come back to that picture later. Uh, this is just an example, but this starts connecting to the co concepts of energy in general. I'm going to spend another five minutes on going quickly going through a couple of Ramachandran diagrams, and then I think this is a really good place to take a break. Uh, we spoke a little bit about these Ramachandran diagrams, because remember, this is a Ramachandran diagram, but here I have not drawn it as completely forbidden or completely allowed, but I've drawn it as areas that are better or worse. These diagrams will in general depend on the amino acids. So I've stolen a couple of pictures from the Finkelstein book here. This would be, this is a simplified, completely fake Ramachandran diagram that only consists of carbons and nitrogens, so only the backbone. And then we would have one region here that would be disallowed because if we, well, this would basically cause the atoms to collide and large areas that are allowed. When we form a glycine, so we start having at least the hydrogens there and some oxygens. So this is at least a real polypeptide. Suddenly there are much larger areas here, the black ones that are disallowed and a few regions that are okay. And this keeps, this pattern keeps recurring as we go to larger and larger structures. For alanine, the completely forbidden areas are roughly the same, but these gray areas are pretty bad for alanine. It doesn't like to be there. And most other amino acids end up looking something like this. So this is really good, beta sheets. And here we're down, we have our alpha helices and possibly left-handed helix. So there are already now, remember what we said about Leventhal's paradox? And they said that a typical residue might have, each of these torsions might be in 36 different positions and that too might be in 36 different positions. There is no way you have 36 squared different conformations here because most of them are being going to be completely forbidden. Nature will never ever try that. So while we have these torsions and proteins are flexible, 
most of these degrees of freedom will end up being forbidden. Uh, there are not that large regions of space we can visit. I will do two more slides and then we're going to take a break. The final part, these dispersion corrections that we spoke about, we need to somehow, we need to formulate those. And we typically group them. So at very close distance, we want to somehow say that it should be, so if you start pushing atoms really close together, things should be exponentially costly. And at very long distance, we should make sure that we are attractive, just as the London forces said. The correct way of describing this would actually be to have something that's 1 over the 6th power of r at large distance. That's just a constant. And at very short distance, we should have something that goes up exponentially. Um, the only problem with this is that, actually, there's not a problem with this. This is a beautiful model. And to tell the truth, it's probably the model we should use in the future. But when people started this in the 1960s, computers were slow. And it turns out that it's pretty expensive to calculate an exponential function on your computer. Well, that doesn't matter. We need an exponential. That's the correct functional form. Until you start thinking a bit, well, how frequently is it going to be for you to have your atoms in a protein in here? No. So there, there are some areas that are really important here. If you're, for instance, if you're building a nuclear weapon, then it's going to be very important what happens when, what, what's going to happen when you have these pressures that are 10 to the power of 10 or something. You don't have pressures of a billion bar or something in a protein. So with the caveat that I think that this is a better functional form, we probably should move to it. People quickly decided, you know what, we can cheat here. So can you think of something else? Rather than having an exponential, we would like something that goes up steeply at a very short distance that it's easy to calculate. So well, the easy, if we always already have 1 over r6, take that number and square it. One multiplication. And then you have 1 over r12. <laughs> and that's in practice what people have been using for 30 years. So then you have a potential that looks almost the same. It goes up as 1 over r12 there, but it's still attractive at very long distances. The reason why I show you this slide is actually this diagram that you also have in the book. So the energies we talk about here. The energies you're... So first, the distances here is in the ballpark of 2 to 3 angstrom here. So it's very... So that's when atoms start to... Uh, the, uh, the van der Waals or Lena Jones distance between atoms. But the energies, you're talking about 0 0.1 kcal per mole. So they're extremely weak interactions. But you have many of them. And those are going to be important too. I think this is an excellent point for a break. Uh, after the break, we're going to continue with hydrogen bonds and a little bit of energy landscapes, and then we'll start deriving the Boltzmann distribution. And I have a tons of slides for it. The reason, I don't think it's going to be that difficult, but I've pretty much written down the entire derivation so that you have it in the uh, lecture notes too. So I, <laughs> I spoke about the Lena Jones interactions before the break. Um, and the final part of this has to do with hydrogen bonds in proteins that I touched a little upon yesterday. Hydrogen bonds are typically perfect in ice. In ice, hydrogen bonds would be perfect. So you have the oxygen and the hydrogen, covalent bonds. But because the oxygen is so electronegative and will pull the electrons to it, that will almost create something like half an ion on each hydrogen. And that will cause it to form these really Technically, we call it an electrostatic interaction, but this one is so strong that it's kind of halfway between a normal non-bonded electrostatic interaction and a covalent bond. Hydrogen bonds are really important. And that brings you to this other question is that what happens if we start from ice when virtually all of these hydrogen bonds are formed and then we start to thaw the ice, we add heat. As you saw in the movie yesterday, we somehow break the hydrogen bonds. But the question is, is it that you break some hydrogen bonds while others are formed all the time? Or do you somehow distort all hydrogen bonds a little bit? So this is, this is actually, it actually happens to be the right answer, but it's not a trivial answer. And it's, certain, it's something we didn't know until like 20, 30 years ago. And this is relate, this is gonna, eventually going to be turned out that this is a phase transition, uh, but it's also intimately related to what happens, for instance, in a protein, when a protein folds or something. And that's why I'm, the book has a plot in it, but that's why I'm bringing it up here. So this is a very simple model of uh, an IR absorption spectra for the oxygen to hydrogen interaction. And 
basically the wave the wavelength here will give us some information about what type of property this is involved in and we have three types of samples here we have one ice so this is a sample where all the hydrogen bonds are actually formed and then i have a clear peak at a particular frequency here that corresponds to actually having a hydrogen bond the second one is a bit strange so it's water but water is not the solvent here you have a tiny amount of water in a carbon tetrachloride solution so this is water that does not form any hydrogen bonds and then you end up having a resonance at a different a peak at a different frequency so if we had a structure in water where some hydrogen bonds kept being maintained while others were completely broken then you would have a system with two peaks right one peak here and then it would go down and you would have one peak here but it, what happens in practice is that you get this third effect a very smeared out spectrum instead so that all hydrogen bonds have moved a little bit more to the distance when they're not formed very very simple setup and we're going to come back to this when we talk about proteins so these the beauty with these simple measurements is literally they are simple you can do it in a, an equipment that costs a couple of hundred dollars or something and it gives you an absolute answer in this particular case either we would have two peaks by model distribution or one peak we have one peak and that means that all bonds tend to become more loose in water you have no idea about the stuff that's written about hydrogen bonds in water dave chandler is an amazing professor in california and he keeps he keeps reinventing this thermodynamics and every time i read a new paper from i'm so astonished uh, water is an extremely complicated liquid and that but with that we can start to say a little thing about these hydrophobic effects um, we're going to come back to this later on remember what i said about the hydrogen bonds that they're so strong they're almost a covalent bond it's a lot of energy so waters will do almost anything they can to maintain their hydrogen bonds five kilocalories might not sound like a lot but compare these to the 0.1 kilocalories per mole that was the non-bonded interactions if you start losing your hydrogen bonds that's a lot of energy particularly if every single water molecule loses one so what happens if you now put a hydrophobic solvent like a xenon or something in there what these water molecules do they will not just be happy and accept that they suddenly lost half of their hydrogen bonds these water molecules will start to reorient so at any cost they will try to find other neighbors to form hydrogen bonds with instead so what you're going to do is that you're going to form a cage-like structure around the hydrophobic solute uh, so that these waters pretty much maintain all their hydrogen bonds and this is a bit unexpected right because you would imagine that the reason why it, the reason why it would be expensive to solvate something hydrophobic in water would be that we started to break hydrogen bonds that's not true you keep all those hydrogen bonds but that begs another question so that, but in that case why is it so bad to solvate something hydrophobic in water you don't lose any hydrogen bonds from it we'll come back to that tomorrow <laughs> Uh, but that also because because this is so bad you start having these oil water effects that rather than having two small small oil droplets it's better for the oil to form a larger droplet so that you have a smaller interface to water and this is also an effect that happens in proteins but i will go through that later so just to sum up all these interactions this is a slide from wikipedia actually and it's kind of nice because it summarizes everything we have in proteins you have bond vibrations you have angle vibrations you have Portions. you have some Lena jones interactions between any atoms even if there is no direct bond between them you have some electrostatics that we don't show here and then you have some sort of hydrophobic effect that is roughly proportional to the hydrophobic surface area and we'll come back to that how we calculate that tomorrow um, yep one question so um regarding for example the torsion angles and the Lena jones uh, aren't they sort of measuring twice the same so that's that's a that's question is way better than you think um, it's both right and wrong um, so first the main effect from the torsion angles is actually not true um, even if you didn't have anything out here the way electrons and this atom and this atom all right electrons don't like because remember the, there is a sp3 hybridization here so this atom has electrons in four directions this atom also has electron in four directions even if you had no groups whatsoever bound to this these two atoms would still have a torsion potential that looks roughly like this and that had to do with the way the orbitals are oriented 
So it's not, this effect is not primarily because these two atoms bump into each other or something, but it's an effect of the electron distribution along the bond. However, uh, then it's certainly also an effect that if you rotate around that bond, there's going to be an interaction between that atom and that atom. And you can choose how to describe that. Occasionally we try to include that in the torsion, and occasionally we try to include that in the Lena-Jones interaction. Um, it's basically, it's up to you to define where you want it. Uh, just make sure that you're systematic, uh, because these are simplified, they're approximate descriptions. Ultimately, it's all due to the electrons. Remember those Ramachandran diagrams I showed you? We can think of those, we only looked at those as two-dimensional plots and different energies, but you can think of them, drawing them three-dimensionally. We have some, this is not a strictly a Ramachandran diagram, but we have phi on one axis and psi on the other, then we can just let the height here be the energy. So low means low energy, that's good. High means high energy, that's bad. And then you can start to think of this, and again, even this just two, di this just two degrees of freedom will give us something that looks like a landscape, right? So you're gonna have some peaks, places where it's bad to be, and you're gonna have some trolls, blue areas here where it's really good to be. But now life gets more complicated because if you are in, one valley here, I want to get over to another valley, you will always, there is always going to be some ridge you need to cross. And depending on how high these ridges are, occasionally you will be able to move to one valley from another, er, and occasionally it's going to be too high so you can't get there. And you will almost never be on the peaks. And this is the so-called concept of energy landscape, and we can describe this a lot in as much detail as you want. The only caveat is these are super simple energy landscapes. These are two degrees of freedom. A typical protein, if we forget, and again, if we do the approximation we used yesterday, forget about everything except the torsion angles. Even for a small protein of, say, 50 residues, you're going to have 100 degrees of freedom. So that would be a 100 one-dimensional plot. And I'm not sure about you, but I find it really hard to visualize 100 one-dimensional spaces. So these are really good for thinking about things, but we should bear with this, really, we can only draw these in three dimensions if it's two degrees of freedom. But when we talk about energy landscapes, we really talk about the ability and possibility of a molecule to explore different regions here and how expensive is it to move from one region to another. Because what could happen here, in principle it's good to be at the low regions and it's bad to be at the high regions. But what if I am here, that's not the best place, this one would be the best place, but if this barrier is so high that it takes me a thousand years to get there, it doesn't really help, right? I'm always going to be stuck in what I think is the best of worlds out there because I don't, I can't go across the saddle pointer. And in many cases, that's going to turn out to be the case. So we haven't proven this yet, but I'm going to whet your appetite. What the prions we talked about yesterday, these proteins that can misfold, what I'm going to come back to later on in the course is that what likely happens with prions is that the normal native state, the biologically normally functioning state, is a state like that. And we're typically very happy there, and normally nothing happens. But under some circumstances that we don't quite know about, you can cross the barrier to some other states that's even better, even lower energy. And it's, we call that a misfolded state. Well, nature calls it a better folded state. The only problem is that that is bad for you biologically. So that's when you get these plaques or something. And of course, the second that some protein starts to form here, that might drop the barrier more and more. So you might start having more and more proteins go to the wrong place. And for prions, this is likely the case. But for now, you have to take my word for it. The only problem here, though, is that at some point, we're going to need to decide how many particles are in red and how many particles are in the different blue places. Otherwise, it's not really going to help us a lot, apart from the fact that we can draw some beautiful pictures. So this now requires, we need to start on what is the probability of being somewhere as a function of what the energy in that state is, right? And this is complicated because there's pretty much only one way to deal with this and it's called statistical mechanics. And it's a pretty tough area in physics. Uh, the good thing is that we're not going to go through all of physics, but there's this beautiful quote for you. Um, David Goodstein, he wrote a book about uh, statistical mechanics in the 1960s. And you could probably, well, sorry, it's a bit of, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, who spent much of his life studying statistical mechanics, died in 1906 by his own hand. Paul Ehrenfest, his students carrying on the work, died similarly in 1933. Now it is our turn to study statistical mechanics. Perhaps it will be wise to approach the subject cautiously. Um, 
I can kind of understand the math point. <laughs> Statistical mechanics is extremely complicated. And it's equation after equation after equation, and there can be pages of equations. When I was a student, I remember solving these seven dimensional Gauss integrals by hand. My professor was 30, 40 years old, I thought that was a completely natural thing to do. But the thing is that it's powerful, it's extremely powerful. And statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, because we don't, this is not something that builds on other laws of physics really. It's something that builds on observation. We see what things happen in, uh, in nature. And I also, for this reason, this is likely the only field of physics that will never ever be overturned because it's based on observation, what things do happen in practice. The amazing thing is that this also governs everything we see in chemistry, biochemistry, proteins, and to tell the truth, most experiments that you work with. Historically, experiments tend to gloss over this fact, well, we take an average. You know, those average works great if you work in a test tube and one mole of something, but the second you start having single molecule experiments and you're looking at one or two or three molecules, you can no longer ignore statistical mechanics because nature is statistical in nature. The good thing is that we're not gonna go through everything. The other good thing is that this was a pain in the days when we had to do everything with paper and pen. Today we have computers and that makes, this is what I would argue why suddenly we can apply this in life science and everything because we let computers do the hard part. And this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon, you're actually gonna do some very simple apps on this with computers, which means that you're not gonna have to sit down and do the manual labor intensive deduction. But there is one thing I'm gonna show you which is we're not going to have a whole lot of equations, but this is one equation that is important. I'm just going to throw this up. It's called the Boltzmann distribution. And this says the probability of being somewhere in a state, and right now I'm not even going to say what this state is. You can think of this as the blue point on the map, or you can think of the state of an electron. The, the probability of something happening. That is proportional to an exponential function raised to minus the difference in energy or the energy uh, because this probability if it's a difference it should be some difference compared to a reference state divided by kt kt is Boltzmann's constant and t is temperature because we have this is just a constant we're going to ignore that for now and what temperature is in the denominator there what this means that if you take something like the speed of atoms in a gas at low temperature, you're going to have a narrow distribution where the speed is fairly low, but as, because it's, it's much better to be at low energy states at low temperature. But as we're increasing temperature, I'm going to get a wider distribution and I will also be able to populate higher energy states, in this case, higher speed. I haven't proven this at all. This is just something I've thrown out, that this is going to turn out to be the case. And in principle, we can derive this. Um, the, that might not sound like an amazing thing, but it is amazing. We can derive this without assuming anything. This is both the major pain of physics, but also the beauty. We can have a system, a system that you don't know anything about. It's just a system with properties. Normally we say that that property is that we can exchange heat with the rest of the world, energy. And then you can show that this is universally true. If we're going to do that, we would spend the next hour or two hours at least, and half of you would not show up tomorrow. So I'm going to try to avoid that. Um, we might do that later on in the course. But just to at least argue that this is reasonable, I'm going to do that for a specific case. And then it actually turns out that all the properties of that specific case factors out. So in the end, the result doesn't depend on the on this specific case at all. So I'm going to try to derive this in a fairly simple manner. Um, and deriving the Boltzmann distribution. Ah, stop me if you can't follow this. So this fairly simple manner is at least the easiest example I and the book could imagine. So if you have some sort of column or vessel, whatever, and we fill that with gas. Without knowing anything, you will probably agree with me, think of the, uh, the Earth atmosphere, that we're gonna have higher density, we're gonna have more molecules down here, right? And then we're gonna have lower density, fewer molecules up here. Why is that? If you think of this being one kilometer high or so. Yes, because gravity pulls things down, right? So it's better to be down. But if we had all the molecules at height zero here, we would have an almost infinitely high pressure. So that pressure, pressure causes things to spread over the entire vessel, but on average it's better to be down. So we're gonna have more down here, but then we're gonna have less and less up here. 
And that actually, the gravity, that is really well described by the potential energy here, right? The higher up we are, the higher the energy is. And the lower down we are, the lower the energy is. So already here we can see that it's better to be in low energy, but we always have something in the high energy. So we can describe that energy with the height. And we have high density, low potential energy downstairs, and low density, high energy upstairs. And as you also said, we have two effects here. Gravity pulls down while pressure counteracts that, and pressure would, if we had no gravity, all the particles would be uniformly distributed in the vessel because there would not be any pressure gradients anymore. So let's study one particular tiny region here, the yellow one. And my question is really, how many molecules do we have here? Remember that's because if we can say how many molecules, or at least the density of molecules, that really answers the question we were after, right? How likely is it to be somewhere as a function of the energy of that state? How do we determine that? Without sneaking, looking at the... <laughs> Sorry? We need to know how big is. So this is the hard part, right? And uh, normally when you do in maths, people throw all the information at you. And in, in many ways that's good because when you have all the information, you start to calculate the exact pressure, the exact volume and everything. But of course, the beauty and the difficulty emphasis, it doesn't depend on the exact volume. These laws are universal. And that is usually when you start out that it's very hard because you don't have any concrete numbers and that you, you feel that you have nothing to work with. You always do have something to work with because we can assume that that volume is V, for instance, and hopefully in the end it's gonna turn out that the answer doesn't depend on V. If the answer depends on V, something, either something went wrong or we used the wrong problem formulation. So that one solution to this is to aggressively introduce, for instance, the height or the volume or whatever we call things. But at equilibrium, when things don't change here, um, Remember that I had these two forces, gravity and pressure. So when things don't change, they, have, they kind of have to be similarly strong, right? So that looking at this small volume, it has to be the same amount of, uh, the gravity must exert the same type of work down as the pressure exerts up. If this was different, things would change, and then I would just wait until it has stabilized and look at it. So when things are stable and don't change anymore, I should be, they should be equal. And that also means if I'm standing here at some height h, if I go just a tiny bit up, dh, and that can be infinitesimally small. Well, so what happens here is that my pressure will have changed a bit because the pressure is lower higher up, right? And that change in pressure must correspond exactly to the amount of, well, the amount of gravity pull on this small volume down. So that usually when you have two things, in this case gravity and pressure, we just need to find when are they going to be equal, and then we just try to solve that equation and remove as many things until we hopefully end up with something simple at the end. We're going to try that. So the first thing we're going to use is the ideal gas flow. Most of you are chemists, right? So we're going to start at that side. PV equals NRT. Okay, you're going to be happy in a minute if you're not a chemist. <laughs> the pressure times the volume equals the number of particles multiplied the gas constant multiplied by the temperature. That is simple. If you're a chemist, the gas constant is roughly 8.3 per uh, uh, 8.3. The problem is that chemists love counting in moles. Physicists hate counting in moles. Physicists count atoms. The only difference here is Avogadro's constant. So sorry, this is a physics topic, so I'm going to change here. In physics, you say pressure times volume equals, this is still an N. It's a completely different N than that N, of course. This is the number of particles instead of the number of moles, par particles per mole. And this K, this is means a fundamental constant in nature called Boltzmann's constant. And again, the difference between K and R is just really Avogadro's number. But since we are, we're going to try to be physicists here, PV equals NKT. That just tells how much pressure do we have in a particular volume with the number of particles or atoms in this case and at a particular temperature. So, you know what, now we actually did what you suggested. We introduced the volume, and I introduced a number of particles. But since we don't really know what that volume is, 
rather can't we say we take the volume and divide by that on both sides and then we can have a small n that just means the number of particles per volume and then I've just gotten rid of the volume this is a density if you make the system twice as big we just double the number of particles but I also double the volume the same laws should apply so now I have one one fewer strange pieces that I need to deal with and that means that this equation is now p equals small n kt that was the easy part and well as I said that we're gonna see we would need to see what happens when I move up or down this column right and that's well the only thing that changes when I move up or down that's the height so let's take this small expression and derive it with respect to the position the height so derivative of the pressure with respect to height or p prime we could write too because it's one dimensional that's well, natural constants rarely change with height. Temperature doesn't change with height. It's also in it. So this is really kT multiplied by the derivative of this particle density with respect to height. Not particularly complicated. So now we just know how p varies with height. Uh, that's one side of the equation. The other side is, of course, the gravity, right? So let's see how the gravity changes relate to height. Well, Gravity, we don't need to, we're not going to do anything complicated with general relativity or anything. So gravity is really described by the potential energy, which is the mass multiplied by the gravitation constant multiplied by the height. That is how much the potential energy is when we go up the column. So if we then go up just a tiny bit, dh, the weight of the gas pressing down decreases by the mass multiplied by the gravitational constant, multiplied by the height, and then the number of particles per volume. So we know that moving up by little amount, that's how much the weight changes. But then we also had, when we, all, we also know that the pressure changes by this amount. And by definition, those differences must be, the reason why the pressure changes is because we have fewer particles pushing down, right? So that if these are not identical, I can't gain more in potential energy than what I lose in pressure, then we would not have equilibrium. So by definition, the difference in pressure here, dn dh multiplied by kt must be equal to the mass multiplied by the gravitational constant multiplied the number of particles per volume. The reason for the minus sign is that the pressure decreases when we go up. And then we can divide both of those sides by kT. So we simply get the derivative of the number of particles with respect to height is minus a bunch of constant stuff multiplied by the number of particles. That's a differential equation. First order differential equation, which is not very hard to solve, thank God. Uh, and I'm not going to expect you to solve differential equations. That's not part of the course. Uh, on the other hand, I also hate throwing up proofs or anything and then say, you're just going to need to trust me what the result is. So the way I solve that equation is I have a derivative of n that results in an n there. The trick you use to that is say that if you derive a logarithm with respect to something, the derivative of the logarithm itself is 1 over the argument. And then we have the chain rule, which is going to be the derivative of the argument inside the logarithm. So if you just use that trick, it turns out that the derivative of the logarithm of the number of particles with respect to the height is just a constant. Integrating a constant is easy. So if we integrate both of those sides with respect to h, there we get the logarithm of n. And here we just get minus this constant multiplied by h plus a constant, right? And then we take the exponent of that. And that means the constant will actually lead to a constant in the exponent. I don't know what that constant is, and I don't really care to tell the truth. So rather than keeping dragging around this constant, I, yeah, whatever, there's going to be a constant. And that's why I write proportional to. There is some constant, and for now I don't care what it is because I don't know what it is. So the number of particles is going to be proportional to the exponential because we had a logarithm and took the exponential of both sides raised to minus, but wait a second, the mass multiplied the gravitational constant multiplied by the height. Here's where I cheat just a little bit. 
I identify, well, that was the potential energy as a function of height, right? So rather than having this special case of gravity, let's just say I assume that is the energy divided by kT. So that's cheating a little bit. And that's quanta area demonstratum. That's what we're supposed to prove. The number of particles or the probability of being somewhere is proportional to an exponential raised to some energy relative to a reference state divided by Boltzmann constant multiplied by temperature. The book goes through this through, but in much less detail. The book spends four lines doing it, uh, and that's why I have these slides. So what is this constant going to be? Because I, it's hard to say something is proportional. It's, when you're going to do a computer lab, sorry, there is no computer operations. They calculate something that's proportional to something. When you do this in a computer, you're going to need to choose a constant. How do you choose the constant? Mm, so it's easier. If you just have four states, let's make a simple world here. The proportional to be in state one, the, sorry, the, the probability of being state one is this expression, and then it's delta E1, right? The probability of state two, then we put in energy two. The probability for state three is energy three. Can anybody guess what the probability of state four is? That's, of course, energy four, right? If this is now my very restrictive world, uh, I only have four states that I can be in. This is my universe, the so-called phase space, every single possible combination of my system, four states. What is the sum of these probabilities? One. So that you can also say that rather than saying that this constant, you can say that this is equal the exponential of this divided by the sum over every single state. In this case, it would be four states. That sum even has a name called the partition function, and physicists usually abbreviate it by capital Z. If you only have four states, that's pretty easy, because you just sum over four states. The problem is that in the real world, it becomes a bit complicated, because you have a couple of, not billions, not trillions or quadrillions, but even you have like 10 to the power of 30, 40, 50 states. You can't, if you know the partition function for a system, we of course know every single state. If you know this, you know everything. You can predict everything about the system. You can predict how reactions happen. You can predict, in practice, we never know that entire sum. But if we look at two specific states, we can compare them. The only reason for mentioning, I don't think the book mentions that, but in the lab this afternoon, because you're going to do things at a computer, at some point you're going to need to have the sum over all your states, and then you're going to see this capital Z. This is much more useful than you might think. So if we have Let's again be limited here. We have two states. Let's say a cis and a trans state of a torsion. Now, you can argue that, you know, it's much more complicated. You have tons of atoms connected to it. Remember what I said yesterday. We should always simplify as much as possible. So let's just ignore all the other things for now. One bond, cis or trans. And the probability being in state A, we can say that cis. That's some constant multiplied by the exponent of that minus that energy divided by kT while state B, which should then be trans, is the same thing but the energy in the trans state. And now I stopped writing a delta energy here, and the reason for that, in the first case, the delta is just proportional to some arbitrary reference state, and that can be anything. That's like a potential energy. You can say that the potential energy of this remote is based on the fact that it's one meter above the floor. But that's rather arbitrary, right? Why don't I measure it from the street level? Oh, wait a second, perhaps I should use the sea level. There is always, no matter what you're doing, you're introducing sort of arbitrary reference potential, and that's, this delta is kind of unnecessary. It's up to you to define what your reference is. But if you want to know what is the fraction of, how, how likely is it to prepare to be in a cis state compared to being in a trans state? And then you calculate what is the probability of A divided by the probability of B. So that's just the relative distribution of those two. And that again, that's the quotient of the right-hand sides here. And if you know your exponential loss, if you take one exponent and divide by another, that corresponds to subtracting the arguments up there. So this will be an exponent minus delta, the difference between state A and B divided by kT. So the second you have two states, you can compare how likely one state is relative to another directly with the Boltzmann distribution. It tells you everything. That is what you're going to do in the lab this afternoon. Now, normally, 
doing this and proving this with pen and paper, is, it's tedious. A computer, a Python program can do this. You just tell how likely is it to go from one state to another, and then eventually you're going to see that you actually, hopefully, if things go well, you're going to retrieve the Boltzmann distribution at the end of the lab. So the take home message is lower energy states will always be more populated. But how much more populated they are depends on the temperature. At the point, if you eventually approach zero Kelvin, everything is going to be in the lowest possible states because this, this kind of explodes, right? Divided by zero, this would be minus infinity. And that would be zero. Oh, sorry, that would be plus, plus infinity. But on the other hand, if the temperature goes up, eventually, if the temperature is high enough, this argument will become zero. So at, at high enough temperatures relative to your energies, energy differences are not going to be important anymore. So eventually, if you just increase your temperature enough, you will be able to go over any barrier. And they, so you can think of this like an arbitrary energy scale. But the ruler on this energy scale, the units, is kT. So kT describes, that's the natural energy unit in the universe. So what is kT? There is a reason why I didn't tell you what the Boltzmann constant is. It's pointless. You have a guess. Yes, but I don't know what I'm, I'm thinking much more concrete than that. The number in kilojoules per mole or kilocalories per mole. Because we're chemists, so that we usually calculate per mole. You're starting to get there. You're a bit high. You're roughly one order of magnitude too high. So KT is, so first, the wise answer is that nobody thought it was, it depends on temperature. Uh, but at room temperature, KT is roughly 0 0.6 kilocalories per mole or 2.5 kilojoules per mole. You can use whatever you want, but you need to remember the units because 2.5 kilocalories is far too much. So what this really means is that if we use kilocalories per mole, because that's what I use in the rest of the course, energy differences that are smaller or substantially smaller than KT, that's just going to be like gravel on the road. You're not going to feel it. We will just, all those states are going to be roughly equally probable. They're irrelevant. So an energy difference of 0.1 kcal, it doesn't matter. Both those states will be equally probable at room temperature. At zero Kelvin, it would be important. While something like a hydrogen bond, then 5 kcal, that's roughly, that's e to the power of minus 10. It starts to be pretty unlikely that we're breaking a hydrogen bond. So once you start having energy that are higher or significantly higher than kT, those starts to become significant peaks in our energy landscape that it will be hard to get over. Remember that electrostatic interaction we spoke about, 300 kilocalories per mole? So then you're talking about 300 divided by 0 0.6. So the probability of crossing that barrier is roughly e to the power of 3, 400. You can try to calculate on the computer, but you will likely get an error that the computer can't calculate it because the number is too large. So the point, you will never get over an energy barrier that's 100 kcal or higher. And this is, this is the beauty that we get. And we, remember, we haven't, this, there's nothing in here that depends on a protein. There's nothing here that depends on water. This is a completely universal result for any system that suddenly we have a natural energy scale. All energies are not equal. Difference is much smaller than KT, we will just get gloss over, it will feel like a bump in the road. Energies much higher than KT are going to be major road bumps that we won't, don't want to run into. There is another concept that I don't think the book mentions, but I'm going to mention this very briefly anyway. Um, because point, this is not just an equation for corny physicists to realize how, and I'm, I can say that because I'm a physicist. Uh, this is not just an equation for physicists to understand that whether one state is more populated than another. This actually tells you everything about what the system does to. And there's a concept called detailed balance that you might think that when a system has, I think I mentioned yesterday, at equilibrium we're all dead. That's not quite true. So equilibrium does not necessarily mean that all processes have stopped. It's just that when you observe a system, there are no net changes in the system. But no net changes, if you have two states A and B, that just means that the flow from A to B is the same as the flow from B to A, right? So individual atoms, particles, proteins, whatever. If you think of a protein, 
what happens in practice, proteins unfold all the time. But there are other unfold, also unfolded proteins that fold all the time. So you have this equilibrium between folding and unfolding, so that on average you might see that, say, 90% of your proteins are folded. And the Boltzmann distribution actually describes this. So by definition, at the equilibrium, these fluxes must be the same. So the probability of the number of proteins, the number of systems that goes from state A to B, that is partly the probability of going from state A to B, but you can't go from state A unless we were in state A to start with, right? So it's kind of a condition probability. The probability, the complete probability of an atom moving from A to B is the probability of first being in A, which is either the population or the probability there. I kind of use P and N interchangeably here. Multiplied by the fact, okay, we were in A, but what is then the probability, if you are in A, of going to B? So these are the atoms that will move from A to B. And at equilibrium, that must by definition be equal with the opposite. The ones that already are in B multiplied by the probability if you are in B to go to A. And this might look like a completely obvious equation, but it's actually not. Because if you then divide Na, you know, Nb on the left side and keep the probabilities on the right side, that at equilibrium, the population in state A divided by the population in state B, so the relative population, you can also formulate that as the relative flux between the two states. So on the right hand side, I'm not talking about how many particles you have in each state. In principle, I could stand on the top of the ridge and just observe how many particles are going to my left and how many particles are going to my right. I know nothing about the, what is on the left and I know nothing what is on the right. But if I just observe this enough, I can actually tell what are the relative probabilities of being in these states eventually. Uh, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about the Boltzmann distribution. Are you confused? There's this famous, what is it that, any, anybody who isn't confused, this is not about the Boltzmann distribution, but there is famous quote by Einstein, I think, that actually anybody who isn't confused by quantum mechanics hasn't understood it. Um, it's not trivial. The equation here is simple, but there is an amazing amount of deep knowledge here. Because the cool thing, this applies to anything. It applies to every single particle in your body. But we have not derived this specifically for an atom. It also applies to footballs. You can put the system on any scale you want. But that's this abstract nature of things, of course, what makes it complicated, right? We, don't, we can't say what is the system, what is the probability. Because it can be any probability. Just define what your state is and just define what your probability is and you're good. That is what you're going to do this afternoon. And I think we have a little bit of time here. So I will have a chance to go through the rest too. The problem is that that's not enough. There is some, some things that go wrong. And there is something we missed here. So you're going to start to do the first part at the lab. Hopefully everything will look really neat. And then you're going to go through the second part and realize there are complications. Since I have 20 minutes or so, I will go through this. My recommendation is if there is one thing you need to do Today, focus on the Boltzmann distribution, focus on that in the lab. The second part I go through now is more to whet your appetite and we're gonna come back to this tomorrow. Remember when I showed you my gas container? I just showed you the one on the left. But what if it looked like one of those? Which one, of, if you had to pick one here and you somehow got scored, the more atoms could be at lower energy, which one would you pick? And assume, now they're not equal volume, they should be equal volume. But Why? In this case, the circle would actually be largest volume, so you might very well be right, but assume that they all had the total volume the same. I would pick the one on, I would pick that one, because here you have lots of room down here for particles that want to have very low energy, but we don't really need a whole lot of room for the ones that are going to have super high energy, right? But that's just based on a hunch. You haven't proven that at all. Uh, so the problem here is that somehow the volume seems to matter. And that's the volume that we kind of snuck out and we talked about part, average particle density. The other problem is, what do you mean by volume? Volume works great if I derive this for a gas, but I just said that the whole point was that this was universal for a system. So the volume somehow describes how many different ways something can be in. In this way, how many different ways a particle can be in a container. 
Remember when we spoke about the electrons and the spins? Well, that is also a state in a way, right? An electron has a state. So occasionally we can talk about things in some sort of abstract state way, where we will still call it volume, but this, you can think of this, how many alternative ways do I have to do something? And this could be, if I, need to enter, if I need to exit this room, I only have one option to exit it. If I had two doors, you can imagine that's two possible ways. So it's, we will call it volume, but it's not necessarily volume in the cubic decimeter sense. We can think of this as the number of available states too. But you know what? This is not very hard. If we assume this is volume, let's just do the math. So I'm going to do an advanced postulate. The volume of state A is volume A. So you see what I'm doing again? It's exactly, if I don't know something, I just define it and call it that. And the volume of state B is, I didn't write that out. So it's going to be VB. And I would also say to first, I will, the way I count things here is that the number of states is proportional to volume. That's just something I say. There is no universal definition of nature what a state is. But somehow, the, the number of good things here is proportional to the volume. I can define anything I want. These are my equations. I think that if you're not in physics, that's something that you're usually very afraid of. You're, you're afraid to make assumptions. It's perfectly fine to make assumptions. The absolutely worst thing that can happen is that 49 slides from now on, I realize I'm in a bind. I have not been able to do anything. Then it's probably time to start going back and re revisit some of the assumptions. That's not going to happen here. Uh, but that happens all the time in research. I screw up all the time in my assumptions. Uh, and then somehow the probability should also be proportional to volume, right? If you have two good, well, if you have two doors, it's twice as easy to exit or something. So one way is really easy. The probability of somehow not just being in state A, but being in a volume A that has more than one state compared to volume B, then I should just multiply both those expressions to volume as a constant. There might be some other constant here too, but the other constant cancels out. That was easy. We just solved it, right? Um, there is one little problem here. What is the little problem I have? Can you use that in your lab? Why? Is no, there is no proportion. It's very straight, beautiful, no equal. So what is the volume you're going to use in your lab? So this is just a completely arbitrary symbol that I introduced, right? You have absolutely no idea what that volume is. So this looks beautiful as an equation and it's completely unusable in practice. And that's the danger that you can introduce, you could argue that this is kind of a screw up case. You can introduce any number of things I want, but at some point I need to get them to cancel out or remove or I'm going to be stuck in something that looks beautiful, but it's unusable. This is unusable unless I know what the volume is. The problem is I don't know what the volume is. I have absolutely no idea what the volume is. And in principle, I'm stuck here. In principle. The advantage in the Church of Physics is that what do you do when you're stuck? Yeah, yes, we'll define something. Um, the energy here is somehow a property of this state, right? I would like to move this volume up in here so I can somehow group it and say that this is a property of the state. Let's see if I can do that. So I use a trick. The volume is just the exponential of the logarithm of the volume. Exponential and logarithm are the opposites, right? So that, that's, that doesn't mean anything. And then I can say, instead of having the volume as a factor in front of the exponent, I get the logarithm of the volume up in the exponent here on both sides. And then I can just, I would like to divide them both by kT. So I say that it's the exponent of minus the energy minus the temperature multiplied by Boltzmann's constants multiplied by the logarithm and then divided by kT. It looks absolutely horrible, I know. But you know what the funny thing is? That looks like a Boltzmann distribution. It's exactly the Boltzmann distribution. But instead of having my beautiful energy, I now have an energy minus the temperature multiplied by the Boltzmann's constant multiplied by some strange logarithm. But somehow, so this is kind of a correction factor or something to the energy that we can group together with the energy. I still can't solve this because I still have the nasty volume. And if I don't know what the volume is, I sure don't know what the logarithm of the volume is. 
But this, as a physicist, if I can't even get further with that definition, I can define this. I've, I've frequently, I always call it energy. I remember there were a couple of slides where I said that technically this is a free energy. If that is the energy, this entire group is what I'm going to call the free energy. And we're later going to see that that corresponds to the amount of energy that's available to perform work in a system. You don't know that now. You're going to have to take my word for it. But if we somehow, if you have an E, can you imagine any other letter? We could just call that F, next letter in the alphabet. Comes natural, right? And then, because you don't know, in general, you don't know what the energy of a system is. Uh, you will just assume that or assume that you can calculate it. This is some other property. It's going to have the same units as energy. So let's just call that F. But that's kind of cheating, right? Because to calculate, if I can't calculate the logarithm of the volume, I sure can't calculate F just because I changed the symbol. So we're going to need to introduce something here. This, the temperature is kind of nice to have on the outside, but Boltzmann's constants multiplied by the logarithm of some volume, that's what I'm going to call, we need a name for it, so I'm going to call it entropy. How many of you have stumbled into entropy before? And then you try to understand it. You try to understand entropy, right? That's what all chemists try to do. You can't understand entropy. This is what physicists do. And entropy, this is just something that comes out as a result from an equation. And rather than have a logarithm, of, this is a physical definition. It's going to turn out that this definition is pretty darn useful because it corresponds to something. But an entropy, just as the energy is a property of a state, and again, the energy of the remote control as a function of the height over the table. If I have states and if I assume I can measure things, in principle, this, is a, this S is a property of a state that in theory at least we should be able to measure. At least differences should be possible to measure. So rather than just having an energy, we can define this free energy as being an... This is really the expression I had, right? Energy minus temperature multiplied Planck's constant logarithm of volume, but then we replace K, L, and V with S. This might sound really stupid. Why on earth are I doing this? Well, the beautiful thing here, there are two things that are really beautiful. First, this now looks exactly like the Boltzmann distribution. It is a Boltzmann distribution, by, uh, by the way, but we have a delta F instead of delta E in the argument. But the other beautiful part here is that there were kind of two parts in nature. We had one part that describes energy in the system, the interactions. This part, S, then describes how many states with similar energy are there. For instance, in this case, a volume A, if the, all the particles in volume A had the same property, they have the same energy. So S here somehow describes how large volume A is, that would be SA, while SB would describe how large volume B is. And rather than volume, we could think of this, it's not really a volume, it's a logarithm of volume. You can think of this as the number of available counted microstates or something. Don't try to understand this from now. It's just that somehow, magically, this S describes the number of available copies of something. The neat thing by having T outside it, because T is not a property of the system. T might change the temperature from one experiment to another, right? So this is a property of the system, that is a property of the system, the T is a property of an experiment. So this is up being a very neat definition, because this entropy we can measure, the energy we can measure, and then we can study things, what happens as a function of the temperature here. When you, those of you who have stumbled upon entropy before, I probably stumbled upon this definition that it somehow measures disorder in a system, right? If something is very ordered, if something is perfectly ordered at absolute zero Kelvin, so that there is only one single possible conformation it can be in. Imagine an ice molecule that's so perfect that every single hydrogen bond is perfectly formed in it. I know that, forget about quantum mechanics and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and everything. If at a perfect ice crystal, there is not a single atom you can move in this crystal because you would break a hydrogen bond. How many states are that? One. The logarithm of 1 is 0. So at 0 Kelvin, the entropy of a system is 0. There is no disorder. And as we're starting to break things, there are many... If you imagine an ice crystal with 10... Well, a small ice crystal with 100 molecules, how many ways are there where you have 
one broken hydrogen bond? Well, quite a few, right? There are even more states where you have two broken hydrogen bonds. There are even more where you have ten broken hydrogen bonds. So the higher your, the more disordered your system is, the more alternative conformation there are that have the same energy. So that's normally the more disordered a system is, the higher this factor S is going to be. And that's why we somehow think of this as disorder. But make no mistake, it's not that we try to measure what disorder is. This is a physical definition that just turns out to be a really good representation of disorder. And that's why I say don't try to understand it. This is a definition. It's a Boltzmann's constant multiplied by the logarithm of the states. Um, yes? Could you please um, explain where like, the left side of the equation underneath, there, where's the volume? Because when you go one side, yeah, you have on the left-hand side. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, what happens to the I should probably have a volume. So when I say this is a probability of being in volume A, you're quite right. I should probably say probability of being in volume A here and probability of being in volume It's just what I mean here. I let A represent more than one state, right? This is a collection of states. And I let B represent something else. Um, so I should probably have said volumes here. But it's just that since I got rid of the volume up here, it almost felt wrong to keep carrying the V uh, suffix down here. But it's the same. So A is one state here. But that now is not just one. A is one state that we can measure. But inside A, we have lots of smaller states. And we typically call those microstates. While B is another, but we have many smaller states in that. If that sounds confusing, you can, I think of this ice crystal. An ice crystal, 100, 100 molecules, on average, each molecule forms two hydrogen bonds. That's one state. And we can say, what is, there's one state when we have 95% of the hydrogen bonds formed. From a macroscopic point of view, we can say that's one state that has a particular energy that I can measure. Now, microscopically, there are lots of ways to distribute the broken hydrogen bonds, right? So inside this macroscopic measurable states, you have lots of small atomic states. And that's really what I talk about these volumes. But remember, we're going to go through entropy in a lot of detail tomorrow. So yep. In one way it is, but the point is that I'm, I know I said this is some this is a property of a state that I can measure. So it turns out that this free energy. Couldn't we have just measured the volume? But the problem we don't really know what the volume is. If if you were working with gas particles, yes, I could measure the volume. But if you're working with chemical reactions, what are the number of microstates in which an ethane molecule can be? Beats me. I have no idea. But if you can measure, it turns out that this delta F. The free energy actually measures directly the work we're doing. So if you take a molecule and heat it, we're adding energy. If you're not changing the distribution so that these molecules move over to some other state, there is a direct relation between how much energy I've used to heat this molecule and the probability in which they are. Even though this means that I have lots of multiple states and everything. So the beautiful thing, I never have to count that volume. This is a beautiful way of, delta F is something I can see in the lab. And then I can actually calculate what delta S, uh, sorry, what S or delta S is. But in a way, you're right, yes. It's just that I've hidden it so that this is now a number that I don't have to think about units in terms of a volume or anything. If this sounds complicated, I'm going to try to have a couple of simple examples. Um, I used to have an example here that I thought fit really well, and that's my kid's room. Uh, and I'll. Actually, I'll bring up. Um, so uh, in my kids' room, um, my kids are not so well behaved so that their room tends to look like a bomb has exploded there. And then you occasionally clean up all the toys and put them neatly in bookshelves and everything. And for some strange reason, the next day, all the toys are scattered out on the floor again. So why, if there is now this random force in nature that consists of my kids, why don't the toys ever spontaneously go from the floor up in the bookshelf? That has to do with entropy, right? Uh, but it's not that easy. Uh, so perhaps we can do some, those, you might not have kids. So let's do something simpler. This is a desktop. And on my Mac, you can actually sort things in these groups of folders so that we have multiple icons or something sorted together. So you can think of this as a state. Each of these folders or something is a macro state, so that's something I can measure. While all the small apps and anything here, that's my micro states. As a lab rat, when we're measuring this, we don't really care about all the details in there. 
but the next second you're a physicist and then you care deeply about the microstates and then you try to count the apps inside it. So if you think in terms of lab states, that how many macroscopic lab states does this correspond to? Well, how many screenshots are there? 17. No, there's one screenshot. There's one picture. It's much easier than you think. Uh, the other alternative is, of course, <coughs> this is probably a truer representation of what my desktop usually looks like. Uh, let's ask the same question there. How many states does that correspond to? Yes. So that was the easy question. It's the same. In terms, and now you're thinking like physicists. It's one specific distribution of every single app or document on the desktop. It does not matter. You might, as a human being, you might think that looks, looks neater or something. But in terms of state, it's one specific distribution of all the components. And that could be atoms or apps or toys in my kid's room. But as an experimentalist, maybe this is the more relevant question. How many similar states are there? So this is a very well-ordered state. So how many similar states are there to that one, while how many similar states are there compared to that one? Yes. So there are relatively, and trust me, I have, over, I have years of experimental evidence in my kids' rooms here. Uh, there are very few states that are ordered, simply because there are many more states that are random. And this is the difference, you see, that when we first originally defined Boltzmann, we only looked at one specific microstate at the time, one and one. But experimentally, you know, if you take those two documents and assume that those are the same type of documents, if you swap those, well, it's going to be the same energy. In your lab experiments, it's not going to change everything. You're still going to say that it has the same, I don't know what, absorbance or something. If you take proteins and you say, assume that these are proteins, and let's say we unfold that molecule, but that molecule was unfolded, so let's fold that one again. You have exactly the same amount of folded protein, you're going to get exactly the same spectroscopic signal. So experimentally, you have many states that give the same signal. Macroscopically, it's one state, but microscopically inside it, you have many substates. But you have few ordered such states and many disordered ones. And that's what we describe with entropy. So this one is low S and this one is very high S. And we have actually now derived one of the most important things. Actually, because we can't prove this. Because this is based on um, our, our... And this is strange. Why can't I prove this? It might feel like it as if we proved something, but I haven't. No, I've, the, we only did this. I introduced a bunch of definitions and assumptions, and I said, given those assumptions, we need to do something. The concept of a state, we haven't proven what a state is. And therefore, you can't prove what a state is, because this is ultimately a concept in your minds. Now, and this is the problem, because this is both the, the really big problem with thermodynamics, but also the beauty. This is not based on something else being true. It's not that if somebody shows that the law of gravity is slightly different, that would change thermodynamics. It won't. Because thermodynamics is based on observations and our concept of things. And what we've actually gone through here is the first law of thermodynamics, you probably know that we can't create or destroy energy that would be a perpetuum mobile. The whole concept of entropy is really that the entropy of an isolated system, not in equilibrium, will increase over time and approach a maximum when it reaches equilibrium. So and the total sum of entropy, if you have multiple components, you can certainly have one part of the system going down in entropy, but then another will go up. And this kind of the disorder in the, in the world always increases. This is very much related to the arrow of time in modern physics. The arrow of time, the reason why time goes forward is because of entropy, the entropy always increases. You can't prove this, it's a postulate. And then, as a consequence, at absolute zero, the entropy of any system approaches a minimum. I said that it was zero, but it's actually up to you. You can always put a constant in front of it if you want, because you can, that's like taking your ruler and moving it down. You can change the reference level. But you know what the beautiful thing is? Now you can start explaining lots of things with this. Things that were a bit hard before, but it's going to turn easy. We're not going to do this for proteins. We will save that for tomorrow. Or so. and actually, I'm not even going to do proteins tomorrow. I'm going to do amino acids tomorrow. 
So let's do a phase transition. Ice. If there's one equation, sorry, if there are two equations, the three equations you can learn, no. Two equations you should learn today. Boltzmann distribution is the first one. If you have room for another one, learn that free energy is energy minus temperature multiplied by entropy. This is an equation that's very easy to learn. It's very hard to really understand it. And even I make mistakes. Um, water or H2O can exist either in the form of ice or in the form of liquid water. And you all know that around zero degrees centigrade, something happens, right? Something happens at 100 degrees centigrade too when virtually all compounds in nature go through these phase transitions. So if you look at ice, and this is an ideal piece of ice that would really be zero Kelvin or close to it. But this state is characterized by a very, very high order. But here's the complication. You also have a beautiful energy here because every single hydrogen bond is formed, right? So that the energy here is low. The lower the temperature gets, the better it is. And you also have an extremely low entropy because it's a highly ordered system. So that term is low and that term is also low. So they're kind of gonna, they're gonna have opposite signs here. So they will counteract each other. What can you say from that? Forget about the right-hand sign for now. The reason you're quiet is that you're smart. You can't say anything about it. Like, if I say that the free energy here is 49, will you trust me? That's a very bad idea. <laughs> Don't trust. The point, you need some sort of scale here, right? It doesn't mean anything unless you start comparing it to something. So this equation is usually pointless until you start looking at differences in free energy. Differences in free energy always corresponds to either getting work from a system or putting work into a system. And it turns out that every single measurement you can do in a lab corresponds to a free energy. You're measuring something. So the key thing here is to look at the right-hand side. And the right-hand side, we have liquid water. The energy here is much higher and high energy is bad in physics. We don't have condensed systems have low energy when things are uh, advantages. So high energy is bad for a molecule. The entropy here, I say that it's medium. You could say that it's high. Um, the reason I say medium is that if you turn this to gas, it would be even higher, right? So the problem here, what I now did is that, okay, the term on the left-hand side, E became higher, and the term on the right-hand side also became higher. So this is still hard to say something about. But the third part is really the temperature here. Because depending on what temperature you have, we're going to change the balance between energy and S, right? So if T is zero, how important is the entropy? If T is zero, the entropy is irrelevant, right? Because that term will be gone. So at zero degrees, you would always try to adopt the state that had the best possible energy. And that would be a super ice that's absolutely perfect. You would do anything to maintain all the hydrogen bonds, no matter how ordered your system became. And conversely, at infinite temperature, you can't, don't imagine how you would get there, but at the temperature that's high enough, the energy becomes irrelevant and everything depends on entropy, right? So eventually when you're high up enough, we will do anything to make sure that we can be as disordered as possible, no matter how much energy we lose from it. And that's eventually what's gonna happen in a gas or something. We will lose every single hydrogen bond if necessary because the temperature is so high that it's more important to be as disordered as you can be. So what happens around zero degrees centigrade, for instance, is that when we are ice at minus five degrees, this first term is still just so slightly larger than the second one, and then it's better to be ice. But the second you're at plus one degree centigrade, now that term became larger, and then it's suddenly better to be liquid water. So the entropy really, the balance between energy or enthalpy as we're gonna call it later and entropy can describe phase transitions. We can describe way more complicated things than phase transition with this. So I'm gonna give you a food for thought. The book actually goes through this, but I figured you should have some, there should be some carrot for reading the book. You can explain the hydrophobic effect with this. Can you imagine how? So it's, yeah, it's really like 
plant in that. And uh, so they have to affect this entropic in the sense that um, yeah, what causes uh, proteins or in general hydrophobic substances to fold and collapse together is that it is the way in which the water is less dissolved. But this happens at this temperature because it is uh, so entropy somewhat out of it. Mm -hmm. uh Let's leave the proteins out for a second. In principle, you're right, but if you look at the core, a drop of oil in water or a single xenon atom in water, xenon doesn't dissolve easily in water either. Remember that I said this was, it's somehow caused by electrostatics, right? Because it's, if the solvent didn't have the hydrogen bonds, there wouldn't be an issue. So it's somehow caused by the hydrogen bonds, but then we had this perplexing effect, but before adding the xenon, we had a given number of hydrogen bonds. And the second we put the xenon in, we have how many hydrogen bonds? Maybe two less? No, roughly the same. Remember that the water will do anything to maintain their hydrogen bonds. So we haven't lost a single hydrogen bond. So while it might seem obvious that hydrophobicity is an electrostatic effect, it's not. The electrostatic energy is identical before and after adding something. But the problem is that to be able to maintain all those hydrogen bonds, all your waters went through this acrobatics to form this shell structure around your solute. Is that a more or less well-ordered state? Less. No, it's a more, uh, sorry, it's a, less, it's, it's, a, it's a more ordered state, right? If you're forming a shell, compared to having waters that can mobile and move around and anything, and now we say that the waters have to have a specific shell structure around one given molecule. You're forcing the water to become ordered. There is suddenly a fewer, uh, we will go through that in detail tomorrow, and I will actually have some experimental evidence for it. So that the entropy becomes lower when you're putting the xenome in water. So that the hydrophobic effect is actually an entropic effect. And it's not at all an electrostatic effect. Although it's caused by electrostatics, but it's not an electrostatic effect. Could you imagine any way to prove this? Again, and now I'm just standing here and talking. And you don't have to believe me. Can you imagine any way to show this experimentally? Can you heat the oil and water or something and see how it changes? So what would you predict? Or I guess if you brought it towards zero, So there's one problem here. So if you start doing experiments with water below zero, it's going to be somewhat difficult because it's no longer water, it's ice. So let's stay above zero. <laughs> So what, what, so what happens here is that as we are increasing the temperature, I can start to alter the balance between these two factors, right? So that as I'm increasing the temperature, I can start to look at the solubility of various compounds as a function of temperature. And if the solubility of these compounds is the same, regardless of temperature, then it's an electrostatic effect, right? Or it's an energetic effect, at least. But if the solubility changes as a function of temperature, it's an entropic effect. That's a good question. There are only two possible answers to it. <laughs> one of them is wrong and the other one is right. What do you think? Increasing should be because the state is more ordered, so then there's less state. Right, so when, so when you put this, mo putting a molecule in will increase the entropy, right? But you also have a minus sign here, so that as you're increasing the temperature, it becomes easier to solvate most things in water at least the hydrophobic things like oil or so. It's not an extremely strong effect, and even at 100 degrees, you're not gonna have a huge solubility of oil and water, but there is definitely, there is a small temperature dependence here. That's actually an excellent study question. I might add that tomorrow too. Um, that pretty much, I think I'm not really gonna, the key thing here is that the Boltzmann distribution, you're gonna be battling with this this afternoon too, and I uh, try to get a feeling for what this means. It's really, it will help you a lot later on. And it really explains everything. If you then feel that you want to, there will be some possibilities for at least to have a quick look in the lab and understand what happens with entropy. But uh, 
Focus on understanding the simple part. The entropy is just that I want you to have seen it once so that we can come back to it tomorrow, discuss it tomorrow morning. And tomorrow you're going to have a lab where we actually add the entropy part to it. But today you're not going to be worrying too much about entropy in the labs. Um, I added a bunch of study questions here too. Uh, you have them in the slides and I'll try to encode locally in my computer so I can hopefully get the lecture up a bit earlier. And uh, there is also lecture slides all uploaded online. So I would suggest that we go through this tomorrow morning the same way as you did this morning. If you understand, my point, if you understand these study questions, you're going to pass the course. Uh, and that's why I tried to occasionally include a couple of them that I haven't talked about in the lectures. So read the book. And I think that's all I had today. Do you have any questions?